We are live. A very good evening to one and all of you for the ARC update series on neuroophthalmology. The top experts and amazing array of top-notch speakers beautifully laid out topics to initiate more learning. So I, I believe it's going to be a very riveting webinar. Dr. Pradeep Sharma is our expert panel, is presently heading the Department of Pediatrics, Stabismus and Neuroophthalmology of the CFS Group of Eye Hospitals after a major stint at RP Center as a professor and head of pediatrics, Stabismus and Neuroophthal departments there. He has the most amazing set of every conceivable award, which time would not permit me to read out, over 175 publications and number of book chapters, section editor in IJO, review of journals, and a lot, lot more. Our next coveted expert panel is Dr. Gordon Plant, who is a consultant neurologist of the National Hospital of Neurology and Neurosurgery at the Mufi's Eye Hospital, with particularly great clinical and research interest in neuro, neurological disorders, with deep insight into how the future of neuroophthalmology should shape up to. Dr. Satya Karna is the additional director, Department of Ophthalmology of JP Hospitals, New Delhi, with an amazing skill set in many subspecialties of ophthalmology besides neuroophthalmology, pediatrics, and strabismus, a very versatile figure. Dr. Rohit Saxena is a professor of ophthalmology of All India Institute with great academic career, principal investigator of numerous funded and non funded research projects, published in more than 130 index journals numerous awards, and presently the member ARC North for the second term with a great presence. We have as an expert panel, Dr. Rashmin Gandhi, neuroophthalmologist of immense standing from Hyderabad, a great academician with numerous awards of excellence and recognitions, a born teacher ever so popular for his amazing success teaching pearls over the years. We have with us Dr. Sujata Guha, heading the Shankar Netralia Group of Hospitals at Calcutta, has specialized in pediatric stabismus neuroophthalmology and is known for her surgical skills and brilliance. I have co-moderating with me Dr. Murli Dhar, who heads the Department of Pediatric Stabismus and Neuroophthalmology of the Eye Foundation Group of Hospitals, a prolific, brilliant surgeon and a priceless gem to our group. Our first speaker to start off the grand round session is Dr. Durga Priya Darshini, who is a consultant neuroophthalmologist at Shankar Netralia, Chennai, who will set us off thinking in the right directions in her very interesting case. On to you, Dr. Durga. Would you share your screen? You are muted. You have to unmute yourself. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, ma'am, for this opportunity and the kind introduction. Uh, so I'll be sharing my screen. So uh, my case is about a 69-year-old male who came with a complaint of sudden painful drop in vision in the right eye for the past four months. He was diagnosed locally as a retrovulbar optic neuritis and had uh, received treatment with IV steroids for, fa for five days. But during the course of IV steroids, the uh, patient had an eventful course. Uh, he gave a history of palpitation, chills, and driver, rigor following IV steroids. And he was admitted in an ICU and uh, treated by a cardiologist and started on a short course of oral steroids when the systemic condition stabilized. He gave a history of partial recovery in the vision following treatment. And uh, there was a past history of RTA in 2007, during which he had an injury in the left eyebrow, for which uh, there was a laceration repair, and history of uh, DCR in the right side in 2017. He's also a diabetic and hypertensive on treatment for past 10 years. On examination, the right eye best corrected visual activity was 3 by 60 and 36. Pupils had a relative efferent pupillary defect. The color vision was very poor in the right eye. The left eye best corrected visual activity was 6 by 9 and 6 and the pupils were reacting to light, the color vision was intact in the left eye. Anterior segment examination was otherwise normal, except for some lens changes in both the eyes. Intraocular pressure was also normal. The fundus examination showed a normal, retinal, uh, normal retina, 
but had a pale disc and macula uh, was apparently normal. There was a minimal mild arteriolar attenuation in the right eye when you compare it with the left eye. And uh, the left eye fundus was apparently normal uh, with a mild tessellation in the retina and a normal macula and a normal disc. On examination of the lids and adnexa, uh, in the primary gaze, there was a right exotropia and the left eye was slightly prominent and uh, the, left, there were, uh, the left eye had a small uh, upper lid notch and there was a minimal lower lid entropion. Extraocular movement was otherwise full and free in both the eyes. Humphrey's visual field showed up advanced loss in the right eye and the left eye had few peripheral defects. So MRI brain and orbit was done. Uh, brain was uh, normal except for some mild age-related changes. Uh, surprisingly, patient had some striking lesion in the left orbit, uh, which was deviating us from the right eye. Uh, the patient had uh, irregular lobulated mass in the uh, intraconal space, which was encasing the optic nerve and extending up to the apex. The right optic nerve uh, had some minimal volume loss with some uh, T2 hyperintin signal. So now we were puzzled, like what are we dealing with? Then on probing, the patient gave a history that on stooping forward, he used to have a, a prominence in the left eye and then he pushes it back. And this he has been noticing since 20 years. Then uh, performing a Valsalva, there was a significant increase in the proptosis in the left eye. So then we came to a conclusion that we are dealing with two different entities, right eye having an optic neuropathy and left eye probably an incidental orbital varics. Patient was advised an interventional radiologist opinion for the left eye, the lesion, and they told the lesion is completely retrobulbar and intraconal and not accessible for percutaneous sclerotherapy, so just wait and watch. And patient underwent a complete uh, blood workup for the right eye. ESR, CRP was normal. The blood sugars were uh, fairly under control with a HP A1C of 6.3. ANA, RA, ANCA were all negative. Angiotensin converting enzyme and MANTO was also negative. RPR, TPH was noted negative. NMO, MOG antibody were negative too. CT chest showed a hilar adenopathy, otherwise there was no active lesion in the chest. To summarize, uh, a 69 year old male with a diabetic and hyper, uh, who's a diabetic and hypertensive was on treatment for that, came with a uh, right eye painful drop in vision four months back and diagnosed as a retrobulbar optic neuritis treated with IV steroids. But post IV steroids had an eventful course, had an ICU admission and treatment after systemic stabilization was on short course of oral steroids with some partial recovery. On examination, right eye had an optic atrophy and left eye had an intermittent orbital proptosis. MRI brain was normal. The right optic nerve had some volume loss and some signal and the left retrobulbar uh, vascular lesion. Complete atypical workup was apparently normal. So with two different entities, the right eye having a profound vision loss, uh, secondary to optic neuropathy of a known etiology and the left eye having, having an orbital varix, which is threatening the optic nerve. Um, so the right eye, we were having the, dif the differential diagnosis in the right eye was whether we are dealing with an atypical optic neuropathy or an ischemic. The points which were in favor of atypical optic neuropathy were a patient complained of a sudden painful drop in vision and he was documented to have a retrobulbar optic neuritis with a normal ESR and CRP ruling out any component of underlying giant cell arthritis and has had a partial recovery post-treatment with IV steroids. The points which were in favor of ischemic optic neuropathy were again the age, 69 years, with the underlying uh, ischemic risk factors and a persistent poor vision even after steroids and the MRI optic nerve, which had no enhancement. So uh, I found a paper uh, from China where they have compared the optic neuritis with younger patients and older patients where they have found there was there's lower incidence of dyskinema, higher proportions of brain plugs and higher proportions of corticosteroid side effects in the older patients, which is very similar to this patient. And so is this atypical optic neuropathy or neuritis? So I'd like to take the panel suggestion, like would you be aggressive in evaluating further like CSF or a PET scan and then decide on second line treatment or would you wait and watch? The take home message is optic neuritis is different or atypical in Asian population and optic neuritis and ischemic optic neuropathy are two entities in elderly and may have an overlapping findings. History and clinical correlation supported by a judicial choice of investigation is very essential in such scenario. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. So, Murli. Uh, yes, madam. Uh, thank you, Dr. Durga, for that uh, excellent uh, case presentation. I have a question uh, for the expert panel, uh, <laughs> madam and Dr. Gordon. Uh, what do you do when uh, a patient who has a suspected optic neuritis fails to uh, respond on therapy? 
like i had a, a similar patient a 60 year old uh, lady who turned out to have optic neuritis on mri nmo and mog was negative and uh, we gave her pulse steroid ivmp she had a presenting visual acuity of uh, 6 by 24 and uh, on the third day of uh, pulse therapy she became hand movements close to face and um, we repeated the mri the mri was uh, again uh, i mean there was nothing wrong except for the optic neuritis and i got but in neurologist's opinion also, we continued the uh, IVMP for five days and uh, she recovered, uh, she bounced back to 6.6. Six. I mean, is that what, uh, have you seen that happen anytime with optic neuritis? That is worsening when you start pulse steroids, uh, when SA madam or SRB? Uh, well, I think um, th th there are some patients with uh, optic neuritis who don't respond to corticosteroids at all, even when treated very, very uh, early on. Um, it's relatively unusual uh, for what you've described to have continuing deterioration uh, followed by recovery, because generally, if they're going to recover, they, they do. But, but your, your case is, is, I think, at the, um, you know, the non-MS severe uh, spectrum of autoimmune optic neuritis, isn't it? And, and we've certainly seen those that haven't recovered at all um, and um, d despite steroids, and then you, then we go on to plasma exchange and so on, and uh, often then we think it's too late. And I think in some of those, there's probably a vascular component to it. It's just so devastating and 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 immediate uh, the um, uh, the total damage to the to the optic nerve. Uh, and I've seen it bilaterally as well. Tragic, totally blind cases, despite being treated very very quickly. And I think possibly in some of those. Uh, there's a vascular, inflammatory vascular component to it. Um, it certainly doesn't happen in MS, and it's quite unusual in NMO and MOG as well for, for something like that to happen. Uh, the other possibility, of course, is that it's not optic neuritis at all, and it's something else. I think the, the, the case we've just heard about, I, I was quite interested in the story of pain because um was it pain for painful for four months no during the onset uh, sir i see during so the a... onset the vision drop was painful he came to oh. us with a uh, poor vision poor vision okay so there was a painful onset yeah yeah and the vision dropped and it stayed there for four months before he got any treatment. Yeah, the initial documented vision was around hand movements and uh, he's had some recovery. Like when he had come to us, it was around three by 60. I see. Well, I think in this case, it's just being treated very late, isn't it? Uh, and the fact that he had a painful onset is very much against an ischemic cause. Yeah. Uh, and uh, because uh, it's now um, in a recovery phase, it's not surprising that you don't see any enhancement. So, so yeah. I think in your case, because it was painful at onset, and, and that was four months ago, I think it's just that um, this is now at a, a, at a more or less stable phase. There might have been a bit of improvement, you said. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think this is just very late treatment. No, uh, he received the IV steroids during the acute attack. So my question is, like, he's coming to us four months later, with still uh, a poor vision. So do you consider any second line treatment in such case? Oh, I see, okay. So he had the steroids acutely. Yeah. And you're seeing him four months later. Yeah. And his vision is now stable. Uh, we, uh, we don't know, like at the onset, it was around hand movements. And uh, four months later, it is around three by six. Well, well one, one in that case, uh, well, it's quite useful here to know that there isn't any persisting enhancement. Yeah. At uh, present, there's no enhancement of the optic nerve. Yes, because that, that that suggests then that this is a um, this is a this is a recovered optic neuritis, optic neuritis. with rather a poor outcome, uh, despite uh, getting treated at the onset. Okay. But the fact that there was pain there makes it very unlikely to have been an ischemic optic neuropathy. Yeah. Uh, I presume the disc. Do you know what the fundus looked like acutely then? Uh, sorry, I don't have the picture uh, at that time, but it was documented as a retrieval bar optic neuritis. Okay, so it never had disc swelling. Yeah, yeah, there was no disc swelling. Well, I have my rule about posterior ischemic optic neuropathy is as follows. 
if you never make the diagnosis in your entire career, you might be wrong once or twice, except in, uh, well, giant cell arteritis, which yeah. we see from the other sorts of vasculitis, and uh, also uh, trauma and the perioperative yeah. neuropathies. But okay. the trauma, of course, we don't know that, that they're ischemic. They might be. Um, but uh, certainly the um, perioperative optic neuropathies, they're very often re uh, are retrobulb, are posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Okay. But out there in, in, in the world of, of real events, it's actually quite an unusual thing to happen um, uh, as a spontaneous event with no uh, associated condition like giant cell arteritis or, or, or a perioperative one. Um, so I, I think this must. I think this must have been a retrobulbar optic neuritis, uh, and, and I'm afraid he, he's just come uh, at a phase where he's got lots of axonal loss, and, and is not going to recover. Yeah. The, the blow to the brow was on the other side, wasn't it? Yeah, for the other side. Yes, because that's a common cause of an undiagnosed optic neuropathy. Um, I don't know if you know this story, but um, there's something about a blow to the brow. Uh, the vectors uh, uh, that are transmitted through the skull uh, that cause injury of to the optic nerve, we think in the optic canal. In fact, one of the major studies on that was done in India uh, uh, using using human skulls and and a very big hammer, I think. <laughs> and they showed that these uh, these lines of force, the stresses as such, that you get a shearing injury to the optic mm -hmm. nerve in, in, the, in the canal. So. It's not uncommon for a patient to come with a, an undiagnosed optic neuropathy and then you see a little scar up here. Mm -hmm. anyway, but that was on the other side. I don't think it's likely to be related to, to that interesting barracks. I, I haven't known that to occur following trauma. And of course, fistulas can, but they, they, they are often undiagnosed. The, the, the most interesting one I came across was a, 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 a gentleman in, in Leicester who was strangling his wife. And um, while he was doing this, uh, her, one of her eyes popped out and he called an ambulance. <laughs> she was taken to the hospital and she had a varix behind the eye, which I, I, whether how far he'd have gone, got with strangling her, I don't know. But, but anyway, it, it, he stopped at that point and called for an ambulance. So um, it, was, it was a good outcome in the end. So yeah. they're, they're quite often undiagnosed. We used yeah. to pick them up more up frequently on the old, the, the first CT scanner we ever had, uh, which was jointly purchased with Moorfields, to, to, um, to do orbital imaging, the patient uh, had to be prone. Um, so uh, so th these are often diagnosed unsuspected mm -hmm. because the patient was face down Please in the sense. scanner and, and when I was, was like this. The one thing you have to watch with those, do, do check that there isn't a, a meningocele. Some of them have an associated meningocele, and that's really, really dangerous because they can get... Uh, it wasn't pulsatile, so the proptosis wasn't uh, pulsatile. It's, they, they, they can get a, a serious infection. They can get um, uh, epidural abscesses and so on. Um, okay. But it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting case. Anybody okay. has anything to add before we go on to our next speaker? Satyakarna may have something to add. Yes, I just, just would like to know that the patient had this uh, kind of on and off pro proptosis of the left eye. Uh, you gave that history, right? Yeah, yes, uh, sir. He's never investigated for it, CT scan or MRI? Uh, no, sir. Like, uh, like after he... this right eye problem, after the right eye, yeah, ma'am, uh, Dr. Ambika. Actually, actually he, had, he had a past history of imaging. He okay. showed that showed those CT and all after the okay. entire imaging when we have repeated it only. Only okay. then he said, already I have a problem in my left eye. Now my yeah. right eye has gone into this problem. So wherever yeah. I go, people are getting more drifted to this left. So I did not show this imaging and I did not tell this finding <laughs> what I am having in my left eye. So right. we also said him that don't worry, we are not concentrating on the left. We are more worried about the right eye because that's the better eye for him. So I would like to know from the panel, like, what would you do for the patient at this stage? Well, for the varix? Not for the, I, I'm not looking at the varix. I'm looking at the right eye. So he, he's, a, he's a patient who knows doctors very well, isn't he? <laughs> a very smart one. Yes. 
Um, yeah, so uh, I, I presume you've checked his antibodies. Yes, they are negative. Yeah. They're, they're negative. Well, uh, and he's got no brain lesions no. of any kind. Uh, well, this, so this could be an isolated optic neuritis. Um, what, what I do with those patients is um, I, I give them a letter uh, uh, saying that if they get symptoms again, I ask them to laminate the letter and keep it somewhere. Uh, and it says if they get symptoms again, they have to be seen immediately, uh, have a scan and, and, and be treated with steroids if optic neuritis is confirmed. Okay. I mean, I don't know how quickly he was treated first time round, mm. uh, but um, uh, we, we try to make sure. And also it says that if they have pain without loss of vision, they should be scanned then as well. Okay. If the scan confirms optic neuritis, then they should be treated with steroids. Uh, because uh, uh, although um, the optic neuritis treatment trial didn't, and other trials have not shown any effect of when you give the steroids, um, I think that it, it does make a difference hyperacutely. So, so we make this arrangement. I get phone calls from all over the world saying this patient's just turned up in our clinic. Um, but uh, so, so that, that would be the advice, but there's a good chance that he, it would never happen again. I think there was a comment from Dr. Padmaja. We had done his LP also and, uh, and spine imaging. He has already got both because in fact, we had went ahead and uh, we had also asked him to get a whole body PET screening done because though the clinical picture was painful and sudden drop, which was not fitting towards any, uh, I mean, classical neuritis, and he's four months down to us. We wanted to know what is the other possible cause for this vision loss in the right eye, which if at all, we could escalate the treatment to the next level of a immunosuppression or an IMA or anything which we could do. But he was, he was negative for all those evaluations. Yes, of course. I mean, I think in the past, um, optic neuritis in the elderly has been Overdiagnosed as ischemic, and that's particularly with MOG. Uh, this is why people got the impression that um, because, but MS is is the only condition causing optic neuritis that has this gender and uh, age susceptibility uh, for um, women in the childbearing years. Uh, MOG and NMO are pretty flat, including in childhood. So um, I think that a lot of um, uh, elderly patients, particularly with MOG, where they have disc swelling commonly, mm. were misdiagnosed as, uh, as ischemic and, and, and not given any treatment. So shall we go on to our next case, keeping the time uh, issues which are there? I would want our uh, next uh, moderator to ensure that the discussion gets done in two minutes. Our next speaker is Dr. Virendra Sachdeva, who's a consultant pediatric ophthalmologist, Trambuspus and Neuro-Ophthalmology in Nimagadha Prasad Eye Care Center of LVPI at Vishakapatnam, who would be presenting the second case, which will bring on more thoughts to muse on, and I'm sure it's going to generate a lot of discussions. So let's hear from you, Dr. Virendra. Uh, good evening, madam. Um, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to present this interesting case. I I would like to begin by thanking the ARC and Dr. Chitra Ramurthy Garu and uh, also Murli for uh, giving this opportunity. So coming straight to the case, uh, this is a 50 years old woman who was first seen by us in 2016 July. She had been referred to us from the cornea clinic for evaluation of an incidentally detected disc edema in the right eye. At that time, the patient denied any history of headache, blurring of vision, transient visual obscurations, tinnitus or double vision. Uh, there was significant uh, relevant prior history. She was known to have refractive error, hypertension, and ulcerative colitis for five years. She was on treatment with tablet misalamine for three years, but it had been stopped two, year, two years prior on the advice of the treating gastroenterologist. On examination, her visual acuity was 20-20 in both eyes with moderate compound myopic astigmatism. Color vision was normal by using Ishiara color vision testing. Low contrast visual acuity was good. Anterior segment examination pupils and ocular motility were normal. Coming to the fundus examination, the media was clear in both eyes. The entire fundus examination was normal 
in the left eye, including a normal looking optic disc with medium size. In the right eye, there was the media was clear. There was presence of disc edema along with blurring of margins. And there was hyperemia of the optic disc. There was partial obliteration of the cup. So at that time, the cornea faculty had already obtained uh, autofluorescence, which showed absence of any hyper autofluorescence. But still, the patient was referred to us with diagnosis of compound my myopic astigmatism, press myopia, and pseudodisc edema. When we saw the patient, the patient's visual acuity, refraction, anterior segment, and fundus examination were entirely stable a few days later. The visual fields obtained using the Humphrey visual fields showed enlargement of the blind spot in the right eye with mild reduction of the foveal sensitivity, while in the left eye, the entire visual fields were uh, essentially full. OCT of the peripapillary RNFL showed increased overall RNFL thickness, along with increase in the RNFL thickness in all quadrants. So looking at our own basic knowledge, even if we want to distinguish a mild papillary edema from pseudodisc edema, the presence of obscuration of the peripapillary RNFL and blurring of the disc margins are highly suggestive it's a true disc edema. So our patient was more like a true disc edema. At this point of time, we obtained MRI brain uh, with contrast. And at that time, the uh, available images were reportedly normal. The patient was actually diagnosed as incipient NAI1 at that time, given a presence of a disc edema, middle-aged female, and relatively good normal visual function. So at this point of time, patient was further evaluated for vasculopathic risk factors, and all were normal excepting for moderately elevated serum homocysteine. The patient was started on tablet homocheck, which is combination of neovitamins, tablet aspirin, and was asked to come back in one month for keeping in close observation. However, the patient was lost to follow up for a period of two, two years. And when the patient presented again, she was complaining of headache on and off for six months prior. There was also a history of transient visual obscuration in the right eye on getting up from supine position for two months prior, but there were no other ocular or neurological complaints. So at this examination also, visual acuity, anterior segment, pupillary examination were entirely normal. And the fundus examination was completely unchanged this is the picture of the right and left eye at this presentation. And uh, there was definitely blurring of disc margins, peripapillary RNFL edema, and obscuration of blood vessels at the margins. So this, as compared to the previous presentation in 2016, if we see the disc appearance in the right eye was completely unchanged. So at this point of time, we were dealing with a case of unilateral persistent disc edema with normal visual function. So we were looking at various possible considerations. Could it still be this pseudodisc edema? Unlikely. Uh, could it be an optic nerve sheath meningioma, orbitals or intracranial space occupying lesion? Or could it be simply elevated intracranial hypertension uh, due to IH, CSVT, or a low flow dural AV fistula? These were my considerations. We thought of pseudodisc edema because of unchanged appearance of the disc and a normal visual function. But the points against were like patient had a more, only a moderate uh, myopia, neither extreme hypermetropia or extreme myopia, where this is common. And there was definite obscuration of vessels. So it was more likely to be a true disc edema. Still, I obtained a B scan, which showed only uh, elevation of the optic disc, but there was no underlying disc lucin. Incipient NIIN, the points were in points in favor were like unchanged appearance of the disc, but it should resolve in six to eight weeks by the natural history. So it was not in my consideration at this point of time. Given the fact that she was a middle-aged woman and there was an unchanged appearance of the disc for a long time, uh, could, could it be an optic nerve sheath meningioma which has not caused further damage? The point against what the old MRI was normal, but it was actually a non-contrasted study. Could it be an orbital space occupying lesion? Yes, uh, it's possible, but again, the MRI uh, of the brain and orbit sections was normal. Uh, the most likely differential in my mind was a unilateral disc edema secondary to raised ICP. The points in favor were long standing disc edema, good visual function, and HUF had shown previously only enlargement of the blind spot. Uh, the points against are that it's uncommon, but it is reported. There are few prior reports which tell that intracranial hypertension can present with unilateral disc edema in IAH, posterior fossa lesions, 
and in the largest study by Bytet et al. from Emory, they reported that nine out of the 558 patients had purely unilateral disc edema and 20 had about asymmetric disc edema. So we reviewed the MRI again, and the, at this point of time, we could see carefully that there was a mild flattening of the sclera uh, at the optic nerve globe junction. There was mild tortuosity of the optic nerve. So it's raising concern that it could be elevated intracranial pressure causing disc edema. We looked at the, fit, uh, the patient profile. She was middle-aged woman with medium build, unlikely not completely fitting into a profile for IH. So that's why I was wondering whether it could be CSVT also. Therefore, we obtained MRI brain and orbits with contrast and MRV brain. And these are the relevant images which showed presence of partial MP cella, flattening of the sclera. One minute left. Yeah. And uh, at the MRV brain was suggested to possible hypoplasia and filling defects in bone transfer sinuses. But MRV brain with contrast confirmed the diagnosis of chronic thrombus in bone transfer sinuses. So at this time, we revised the diagnosis, disc edema secondary to CSVT. And she had hyperhomocystinemia and ulcerative colitis. These could be the contributory factors. There is only one prior report uh, of unilateral disc edema due to CSVT. And this patient was a 16-year-old woman with a girl with acute presentation. The patient had actually superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. So for, we evaluated our patient further for thrombotic profile. And we found that she was positive for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase gene mutation. And this could have caused hyperhomocystinemia. And also it is reported that CSVT can occur in increased tendency in uh, ulcerative colitis. So at this point of time, uh, we put the patient uh, in we the patient in consultation with neurologist and patient resolved with treatment with Diamox, Acetone and uh, vitamin B12. This is a picture five weeks later. We can see the resolution of the disc edema and interval improvement in the foveal sensitivity. Thank you very much. This is the take home message that Unilateral disc edema could be due, is primarily due to intraocular and intraorbital pathologies. However, rarely intracranial pathologies might also present with unilateral disc edema. And uh, we should keep in mind possibility of subacute and chronic CSVT that might present only with ophthalmic signs or unilateral disc edema. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Murli, can you take on? Uh, yes, uh, I have a question for Dr. Virender and uh, Dr. Sujata Guha will be discussing this uh, Dr. Virender uh, space. Uh, that is, um, how often do you see a unilateral disc edema, madam? And uh, do you think uh, the multicolor photography, uh, is it of value in distinguishing a true from a pseudo disc edema? There's one more question that I have. Uh, you had mentioned, Dr. Virender, that uh, the optic canal could have been narrow. There is another theory that is propounded that is the uh, meninges may, uh, the uh, three meninges and subarachnoid space may extend around only one optic nerve. So a raised ICT may be passed only to that optic nerve and cause a exoplasmic stasis. Uh, so Dr. Sujata Guha and Dr. Virendra, uh, can you take the question? Yeah, it's, uh, if you have a unilateral disc edema, you really wouldn't think of a raised ICT in the first place. Uh, and um, it was lucky uh, that the patient had gone to a big institute. Otherwise, it would have been missed if uh, the patient had not had an MRV, the, chron the, um, the specific... Uh, just give me one minute. Meanwhile, Murli, can I ask a question to Dr. Plant? Uh, yeah. uh, is, it, is, is it normal or natural for a disc edema because of raised ICP to just remain there, uh, no fluctuation, no increase, no decrease in optical function? Uh, For many years, yes, it, it can happen, yes. Uh, I mean, all, all, all of the disc swelling that we see is, is due to holdup of exo, exonal transport and, and um, uh, exonal swelling. Uh, there may be some tissue edema as well, some transudate there uh, in some instances, but, uh, 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 but that, that can maintain perfectly normal uh, optic nerve function. Um, I must say, I, I usually find with these unilateral cases that there is a small RAPD, even if you can't detect um, in, any other uh, loss of vision. You mentioned the enlarged blind spot. That, that's it's very interesting because actually any swollen disc will give you an enlarged blind spot 
and it doesn't really tell you any more than looking at the disk because it's 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 due to the just the local uh, changes in the retina local hyperopia and also the styles crawford effect because of distortion of the retina um and um th there's no way that you could damage the optic nerve directly and get involvement of just those ganglion cells uh, that are around the optic disc it just couldn't happen so so um you will see that it, it, it's quite a benign finding and so are tvos actually uh, i i uh, we've seen patients ha have TVOs for several years uh, without any deterioration in function. Uh, I had two patients with um, uh, exactly like this with a long history of TVOs and unilateral papilledema. And um, they, they both had uh, optic nerve sheath fenestration, which is, was very, uh, always very successful at getting rid of TVOs. And in both of them, they came back a few weeks to it later with papilledema in the other eye. In one case, it was the first time in nine years. And uh, it had happened for the first time in nine years. Uh, and in the other case, not quite as long as that. Uh, we didn't publish it because unfortunately the, the, the fellow, um, it was back in the days of photographs and the fellow lost all the photographs, got it all muddled up. <laughs> um, but I don't know if anyone, anyone else has come to that. So unilateral papilledema in raised intracranial pressure is rare as you say, and we don't know why it happens. There was a report on, on uh, saying there might be a difference in the um, diameter of the optic nerve canal, but Simon Hickman uh, repeated that and he didn't find that, uh, that. So we don't know why it's unilateral in some cases. But I think your scan is very interesting because it clearly shows the, the, um, uh, the changes of associated with papilledemia, flattening of the globe, and distension of the optic uh, of the optic nerve sheath much more on, on the affected side. Yeah, thank what you very much. Be, uh, yeah. Uh, what would be the uh, dosage of uh, astrazolamide, which is ideal for these cases? Depends which country you're in. Depends which side of the Atlantic you are. I don't know how it, how it is in Central Asia. In America, it's it's four grams a day, and 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 in in Europe, it's a quarter of that. Is it? I don't know if you, by get to where you get to India, is it getting less or, or more? You're going around the other way. I don't know. Um, thank it you very much, Dr. Plant. Uh, very useful uh, inputs. Uh, just to add that, uh, I I was hoping that I will start with uh, 500 milligram per day and see how the response comes. And the patient actually responded. Uh, to about one gram per day. We kept the patient on one gram. And over a period of actually two months, the discodema had significantly reduced. And then we slowly tapered. I think the patient discodema completely resolved in six months on 500 milligram per day. It is very uncommon. Another hypothesis, I think, as Morley was saying, was that there is a decreased transmission of the CSF uh, along the meninges. And then there is one more hypothesis which says that the lamina cribrosa might be different on the two sides. So these are three hypotheses which are there in the literature. Thank you very much. Uh, Wait, does you have any comments before we move on? With, with the cetazolamide, I tend to start on a, uh, on a low dose and build it up because, um, uh, because of the possibility of adverse effects. Uh, uh, it, it tends to be better tolerated uh, if you do that. But uh, other than that, um, as I say, f four grams a day is common in the US. Well, Padmaja seems to differ. Padmaja is from the US and she, she says that nobody gives four grams because people don't tolerate it there. And oh. she says they give 1.5 to two grams and they are able to control the problem with that. Yeah, yes. because it takes out the soda. You cannot have uh, like soda, like your pop after that. So nobody, like, especially if you're in an overweight state like me, like in Kentucky, they will not tolerate that much. And then, so we, we tend to go slowly, but we've touched, as Dr. Plant said, like 3.5 and four grams, but generally like, you know, so we, we slowly escalate. Although like, I know that when we did the IIH study, they said they wanted us to touch four grams in 25 days. Thank you very much for the great discussion. We shall now go on to our third speaker, Dr. Vaishnavi, who is our consultant glaucoma, pediatric and neuro at the Coimbatore branch of Eye Foundation Group of Hospitals. 
a brilliant, hardworking surgeon, highly appreciated and lauded at her workplace. She has another different thought-provoking case to generate a lot more discussions. On to you, Vaishnavi. Thank you, Madam. I thank Dr. Chitra, Madam, and uh, Dr. Murlidhar, sir, for giving me this opportunity. So my case is a case of a 35-year-old male patient who complains of headache for the past one month. Apparently, he Dr. just came here for glass prescription. Doctor, you need to start your screen share. You will not share the screen. First, open your presentation, doctor, and then do the screen share on the Zoom. Yeah. Uh, please put it in presentation mode. Yeah, once. Uh, Ma'am, you need to close the above, above two bars first. Now is it visible? Yeah, it is. Yes, just, just close the above two bars first. Yes, all good. Now is it visible? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Go on. Okay, yeah. Mm. So, mine is a 35-year-old male patient who came with complaints of headache for the past one month. There is no history of any vomiting, trauma, tinnitus, diplopia, or defective vision. Vision both eyes were 6 by 6. Intraocular pressure in the right eye was 12 and left eye was 11. Color vision both eyes was 21 by 21. Pupils were brisk. There was no relative afferent pupillary defect. Extraocular movements were full, free, and painless. Anterior segment was unremarkable and blood pressure measured twice was around 200 by 120 millimeter mercury. Fundus examination showed disc edema with hemorrhages and cotton wool spots suggestive of hypertensive retinopathy. Fields right eye showed a rim defects whereas left eye showed a few central scotoma. And OCT showed thickened uh, retinal nerve fiber layer thickness in both the eyes. And OCT of enhanced depth images showed inward deflection of retinal pigment epithelium towards the vitreous, suggestive of papilledema in both eyes. After consultation with our anesthetist, as the patient was stable and asymptomatic, we gave him sublingual antihypertensive drugs and referred him for MRA scan center because the fields in the left eye showed a central scotoma and we shouldn't be missing out any um, gross abnormality. And we put a word to the treating um, radiologist as not to make the patient wait. So finally, they did an MRI, which showed multifocal, scattered, large T2 hyperintense lesion in the periventricular and deep white matter involving both the temporal, frontal, parietal lobes, and also in the left cerebellar white matter. There is no enhancement after contrast administration. And optic nerves and the extraocular muscles appeared normal. And there is no demyelination noted in the cervical or in the thoracic cord. So from this, what could be the provisional diagnosis? It could be just a case of a malignant hypertension or could be any case of a demyelination like acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis, multiple sclerosis or MOG. And the third differential diagnosis could be a paraneoplastic lesion. So multiple sclerosis, they have multiple lesions which are peripheral. And these are typically ovoid shaped lesions which are perpendicular to the ventricular wall. And these are juxtacortical enhancing lesions. Typically, they have the isolated U fiber layer lesions in the corpus callosum and usually affects the temporal lobe, but brainstem and cerebellar lesions can also be present. Next is acute demelting encephalomyelitis, which is an immune mediated demyelination, most commonly following vaccination or infection. These are usually bilateral, asymmetrical. And these are very large enhancing lesions present in the white matter. And it involves a subcortical and deep gray matter of the basal ganglia and the thalamus. So what are the points for ADEM? Is they, these are, there are hyperintense lesions which are present in the periventricular lesions and in the deep white matter. Temporal lobes are also involved, but the cortex is not involved. The points against ADEM is there is no demyelination in the spinal cord. There is no corpus callosum involvement and there is no enhancement after contrast. So viral trigger is usually seen um, in ADEM. It is unknown in multiple sclerosis. The gray matter involvement is usually subcortical in ADEM and it is juxtacortical in multiple sclerosis. It's usually monophasic in ADEM and the clinical course is usually multiphasic in multiple sclerosis. 
and you get large enhancing white uh, lesions in the white matter whereas in multiple sclerosis you get more of a juxtacortical lesions the third point could be a paraneoplastic lesion which usually occurs, occurs secondary to indirect effects of malignancy or remotely to primary usually it occurs from aberrant hormonal regulations related to proteins by neoplasm so these are seen as a hyperintense lesion in cortical gray matter and in white matter so these findings appear little uh, atypical and so uh, limited screening of the abdomen revealed incidental left renal mass so as a patient was asymptomatic we referred him uh, immediately to a multi specialty hospital and uh, lumbar puncture and the csf analysis was not done because he didn't have that much of headache and he was not at all symptomatic and so they did a ct scan abdomen which showed a hypermetabolic enhancing soft tissue lesion in the lower pole of the left kidney suggestive of renal cell carcinoma and there is no feature of any fdg uptake noted in the abdomen so which was further confirmed by pet scan which showed mild hypermetabolic enhancing lesion in the lower pole of the kidney suggestive of renal cell carcinoma mm -hmm. which is evident and without any metastasis anywhere else in the body so he underwent a left radical nephrectomy and the biopsy showed clear cell carcinoma of grade 1 and stage 1 so one month he came to us for a follow up and you can see the vision is 6 by 6 and color vision is normal and there's gross regression of papillary edema in both the eyes and this is a oct finding you can see before the surgery and this is after the surgery which shows gross reduction of papillary edema in both the eyes and 6 week later vision was maintained at 6 by 6 color vision was normal and bp was around 140 by 90 on a single anti hypertensive agent so disc edema is more common with malignant hypertension uremia and dialysis patient and patient with chronic renal disease have comorbidities and additional risk factors which can predispose to papillary edema and mass lesions can cause increase in the intracerebral volume thereby causing papillary edema and prevalence of optic disc swelling is more with chronic renal disease so renal cell carcinoma it's 70% is incidental finding and 10% of renal cell carcinoma exhibit classical symptoms and it constitutes about 3% of adult malignancies and usually occurs in men in the age group of 30 to 60 years who are mostly hypertensive the classical triad of hematuria flank pain and mass is absent in our case so it is best screened by contrast enhanced triple phase ct there are few syndromes associated with the um, renal cell carcinoma usually the syndromic association we should suspect when the patient is less than 40 years when they have a bilateral involvement when they have multiple lesions and if there is involvement of other organs like liver or pancreas so finally why this case so headache was a presenting feature and there are no renal related symptoms and there is no evidence of metastasis in the brain and papillary edema is attributed to the high blood pressure at presentation and atypical features in mri lead to renal screening and appropriate life saving treatment thank you so at this juncture i would like to introduce dr murugan uh, he is a consultant radiologist from clarity can scan center who was the person behind this case and whose enormous gray cells and eagle eyes helped to arrive at a prompt diagnosis and to initiate life threatening treatment any doubt i think uh, dr murugan will be here for a couple of minutes uh, he'll be uh, happy to take the questions Uh, thank you thank before you start on your neuro ophthalmology discussion one very basic question i had to ask was you how was it that such an acute rise of uh, blood pressure there were no typical av changes or silver by appearance seen on the fundus of this patient and uh, no it was very acute ma'am so in i think in acute uh, phases you don't get the typical av crazy, av changes i think that's very right in actual fact most of the cases of um hypertension with disc swelling i've seen have had very little uh, changes in in the retina otherwise there were some here and i think the reason for that is that in chronic hypertension uh, the medial hypertrophy actually protects the capillary bed and so patients who get malignant hypertension uh, tend to have pheochromocytoma or of course the classic is um Uh, in pregnancy uh with preeclampsia so so they tend to get disc swelling they also tend to get uh, more of these changes in the brain which which result from the same problem 
the um, uh, there's no protection of the capillary bed. I, I'd be interested to ask the radiologist if, if there was any resolution of those uh, cerebral changes after treatment. Uh, Dr. Morgan, can you tell us what made you think uh, towards imaging? And okay. uh, anyway, first of all, thanks for the invitation, Madam, for this discussion. Now, this Thank patient you. actually, I would say honestly, was a little lucky because he landed up when uh, one of our free days. Um, so when we did the MRI, in fact, MRI brain was uh, what was asked for. The findings were a little uh, atypical, as uh, Dr. Vaishnavi pointed out. ADM comes closest, but then ADM, ADM we see in children, usually after a viral illness. Typical history will be there. In adults, we don't see that much of ADM. Uh, so multiple sclerosis was again ruled out because they were all quite big ones. And contrast, uh, NAM study ruled out metastatic lesions and granulomatous lesions. So I was kind of clueless as to what to give it as a diagnosis. So sometimes as radiologists, when we are clueless, we try to screen and get some help. So that is how we ended up screening the spine. It so happened when we screen the sc uh, spine, the technicians uh, take some localizer images, you know, just to for the sake of planning. You know, uh, and the patient, I must again uh, say that I was lucky enough that I was able to see the lesion. Otherwise, you know, in about 50% of the times, we tend to overlook the localizer because we don't see the localizer image because that's purely for the technician. That is how it was detected. Uh, even that time, I did not think about paraneoplastic because paraneoplastic syndrome in brain usually presents uh, in the limbic system. Typically, we have seen in uh, uh, small cell carcinoma of the lung, uh, and the presentation is usually along the hippocampus, parahippocampus, you know, amygdala. And this was again atypical. So even at that time, even after seeing the lesion, I could not connect and give a proper diagnosis of paraneoplastic syndrome. I'm happy that uh, finally it turned out to be a patient is uh, better now. And follow up, was there resolution of, of the brain abnormalities? Yeah, in fact, I was also curious to know. Um, in fact, we can do a complimentary MRI if the patient comes for a follow up and we can document. <laughs> yeah. Anybody has anything else to add? So, Dr. Morgan, uh, do you think it's a variant of a hypertensive encephalopathy? No, no, because in the so called we say press, that is posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, usually that involves the parieto occipital region, yes. typically the occipital lobe. Here it is all, all around in frontal. So we have seen any number of um, press lesions, usually typically, you know, post eclampsia, but this was yes. not like that. Yes. It was typical like an Adam, the only difference was an adult patient. Okay, so if um, we look at the pathogenesis, uh, what I understand here is that a patient presented with a very elevated blood pressure. And in a young patient, the etiology, the first thing that comes to mind is logically a renal problem, which is causing the elevated blood pressure. Uh, so even if he had not had an eye examination and had not had an neuroimaging, uh, invariably he would have gone or had been would have been referred to the physician uh, to look for a renal cause and which they would have you know done an ultrasound and located the same lesion yes uh, it so happened that he presented with uh, you know papal edema and or uh, hypertensive retinopathy and uh, went the other way around but uh, through neuroimaging and then the kidney mm -hmm. problem was detected the, the MCT finding was was interesting because there has been some discussion over the years about raising cranial pressure in malignant hypertension. Um, but of course, you didn't do a lumbar puncture, so you're not going to know. Yes. But generally speaking, it's, it's not considered to play a part in the development of the disc swelling, uh, which is, um, I think, is due to capillary level ischemia. And it leaves the... Uh, uh, the disc very vulnerable to infarction. Um, uh, David Taylor wrote up a, a series of children who'd um, been given uh, uh, acute antihypertensive treatment. And uh, if you lower the blood pressure too quickly, the optic nerves can infarct. Um, so that, that's something to bear in mind. Thank you very much for all the discussions and the thoughts. So we shall now, without delay, go on to our next section, the rapid fire session. And Dr. Ambika Selvakumar is going to be our first speaker in this, who's the director of the Neuro Ophthalmology Department, Shankar Netralia, Chennai, 
who is going to delve into the investigations of third, fourth, and sixth nerve palsies. On to you, doctor. Thank you, Dr. Murugan, for being with us. Oh, thank you, madam. It's my pleasure <laughs> interacting thank with you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. My screen visible? Yes, yes. Okay, good evening, everyone. My topic is investigations in 346 cranial nerve palsies. And in the six minutes given to me, I will try to do justice to that. We all are aware of the anatomy and the close association of all these three cranial nerves right from the nuclear, on, uh, nuclear origin to the site of action. So we will move on to the key evaluation tool of any neuroophthalmic conditions is history taking. So if you have a cranial nerve palsy, the first thing you have to ask for, probably the patient is going to come with a complaint of diplopia. So find out whether it's a congenital or an acquired one and the nature of the onset of the cranial nerve palsy, how long it is present, whether it's progressive, it is involving other cranial nerves, becoming a multiple cranial nerve involvement. Is it painful or painless? And is it associated with or without a vision loss? And always elicit an associated systemic illness like diabetes, hypertension, in our part of the world, TB, HIV, and also a herpes, uh, in, uh, herpes or any type of viral infections. So a previous history of a trauma, surgery, and malignancy is mandatory when you evaluate a patient of cranial nerve palsy. So let me go through few examples and see how uh, isolated cranial nerve palsy do present to us. So this is a 60 year old female who came with the complaints of a sudden onset diplopia, who is a known diabetic and hypertensive. And obviously there is an AB deficit in the extraocular movement evaluation. Already she was three weeks down the line. And she said that there was some amount of a uh, betterment in the diplopia. She felt it is better. So she had a very poor ischemic, uh, I mean, uh, her diabetic control with a poor HB1AC. And six weeks later, without any treatment, she spontaneously recovered her left sixth nerve. So that was a ischemic left sixth nerve. And this is a 56-year-old male with, a, again, a diabetes and hypertension. In India, we see this, too, very frequently associated with most of the conditions what a patient comes to us with. So in addition, the patient also gave a history of headache with a diplopia and ptosis. And this was a right third nerve. And there was a dilated pupil on the right side. So in this, apart from the blood investigation and an MRI, and an MRA is an investigation of choice, which rightly picks the right PCOM aneurysm causing this right pupil involving third nerve palsy. So this is a third case, a 45-year-old male post-road traffic accidents who presented with a vertical diplopia getting bad on down gaze. So you could see the visible left head tilt and a right hypertropia. So that was a right hypertropia, which got worse on left gaze and a right tilt. So suggestive of a right side fourth nerve post-traumatic palsy is imaging was uneventful. So this is a 60 plus year old female, again with an acute onset left sixth nerve. She had a ESO with a headache and she gave, she also was positive for diabetes and hypertension. But interestingly, she gave a history of uterine malignancy. She was just a, a initial days of a diplopia itself. We went ahead and imaged her and this is her MRI. So you started seeing a well-defined lesion sitting around the pons and the cerebellum with a lot of necrotic changes. And that's nothing, a metastasis secondary to a uterine CA. So here the MRI brain and orbit was the first line of choice. So when you see an isolated cranial nerve palsy, when do you watch? So always there could be a positive ischemic risk factors in India, probably. So if there is no other associated neurological symptoms and signs, no eye pain, no disc edema, and no previous systemic malignancy, and if there is a spontaneous signs of improvement and there is no recurrence or previous similar events, probably we can take a back seat and watch if the patient is going to come back for a close follow-up. But always exceptions are there in any conditions. So when do you decide you have to neuroimage a condition of even if it is going to be a less than 40 years or more than 40 years, what is the conventional teaching? I don't think it fits anymore because any cranial nerve palsy, which is non-resolving beyond four, uh, six to eight weeks, multiple cranial nerve palsy, pupil involving third nerve, if there is a vision involvement, if there is multiple cranial nerve with a painful uh, frozen globe, if there is a history of trauma or a malignancy and any of this demyelination 
or any of thyroid or myasthenia previous histories, go ahead, do an imaging. And investigations, we start with a comprehensive ocular and extraocular examination. If there is an optic neuropathy, you suspect it, ask for a visual field because that's going to guide what is the next evaluatory tool for you. And check the BP for all the patients, do a complete workup starting from a basic hemogram with ESR and CRP, because remember giant cell arthritis can also present with cranial nerve palsy in elderly patients. Ask for a light profile granulomatous and HRCT if your granulomatous is going to be positive and a, a syphilis and ELISA for HIV and a thyroid profile if you suspect any of these features of thyroid eye disease. And if a patient is coming with a fixed nerve and there are signs of raised ICP, one minute left. Ask for a. It started. Uh, ask for a LP and a CSF analysis, and don't forget myasthenia is a great mimicker. So ask for an MRI brain in orbit, which is going to be a contrast enhanced one. And if you see a multiple cranial nerves, you have to be very careful because it could be a simple Tolosa Hunt syndrome, which responds very well, like this patient, or it could be a dangerous fungal infection in an uncontrolled diabetic. So this guy came with a frozen globe with a, uh, with a vision involvement and a gross changes in the right cavernous sinus. Post ENT procedure, he developed this and it turned out to be an aspergillus. Post treatment, he recovered well. And this guy is a post viral infection. You can see the uh, zoster scars. He had a two, six and fifth nerve involvement and there was a lesion and the cavernous sinus. So do not forget to screen for thyroid eye disease and always check for ocular myasthenia gravis, a simple eye test in a condition with ptosis. And uh, if it is going to be positive eye test, go ahead for a pre and post tensilon test, which will give us a clue. So this patient was referred to me as a thyroid eye exactly. disease, but it turned out to be having something else when we evaluated with a dense field loss in the right eye and a pituitary mass. Post-surgery, the patient recovered well. So to conclude, not all isolated cranial nerve palsies are benign. They can be deadly. Always watch for vascular risk factors because they will have some amount of spontaneous recovery. Multiple cranial nerve palsies are always a medical emergency. Choose the right investigation of choice. And always when you ask for neuroimaging, do the right technique and ask the radiologist what to look and where to look for, if possible. And ocular myasthenia gravis is a great mimicker and watch for it. Don't miss it. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. That was uh, so much of information packed with that six minutes. I'll ask a very simple question. What would be your follow-up if it is a partial third nerve palsy, which is pupil sparing? How often, how closely would you watch these patients? Okay. If it's a partial third nerve and if it's going to be a young patient, I don't watch. I go ahead and image, even though if it is a pupil sparing. And if the patient is not going to come back for a follow-up and coming from a far-off place. If the patient is going to be a local, an elderly with all these vascular risk factors, I may call the patient for a two weeks follow-up, recheck the pupil, and then take a call on it. Only? Uh, yes, uh, I have a question for Dr. Ambika and uh, Dr. Parif Sharma, sir. Uh, so sometimes we come across uh, children who, uh, who uh, present with acute six nerve palsy following a viral infection or uh, following immunization. So would you recommend immediate MRI or would you uh, give a course of oral steroids, uh, evaluate, and then uh, take a call? Uh, Dr. Pradeep, can I? Dr. Okay. Pradeep, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, carry on, Dr. Ambit. Okay, if it's going to be a child post-vaccination, I would definitely ask for an imaging. And I will not start any child without a imaging or any other associated, uh, I mean, see, uh, neurological evaluation. I will not put them on a steroid. I think that is important to be mentioned because many people are putting steroids in uh, nerve palsies. So unless there is a specific indication, we should avoid that. Dr. Uh, Gordon, uh, would you comment on that? Uh, yes, I agree entirely. Um, and of course, if it is microvascular ischemic, then the vast, vast majority recover and recover completely. So, of course, um, uh, you feel good, very good about giving steroids to those that don't need it. Um, but um, uh, certainly, if there's, if there's any doubt, always image before uh, steroids because you could be dealing with TB or uh, goodness knows what. When would be your time to give a Botox injection? 
Dr. Pradeep, sir, you will try. See, I am not much in favor of Botox, in particular in children, but uh, in adults who are particular for expediting their recovery. And once we have ensured that there is no neurological cause for it, once we have ensured what's the cause, then to expedite the uh, recovery in adults who are like working and who have problems, Botox for six nerve palsies, we may give. But I think it's uh, mostly we don't, we are not in a hurry to give Botox in uh, six nerve palsies. Those who are recovering on their own, so wait for about six weeks. If they're already showing signs of recovery, there is no point. Again, like what Gordon Plant was saying, that these are the cases which would have recovered without giving Botox. And unless the credit goes to that. Yes, there was about, let me see, back in the 80s, um, John Lee, the, who was a strabismologist at um, Moorfields, I'm sure you knew him. Yeah. Uh, he, um, he, he did a study because he thought that some of these patients might be getting shortening of the medial rectus. So he had this idea uh, that um, if you use Botox acutely in these, um, then it would prevent that. But actually, it, I don't think he, he found they were getting shortening anyway. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much. I have a mental image of these cases, which helps me a lot, which is that what you're looking at is a, a short segment of the nerve is demyelinated, but with no axonal loss. And I think we know that from the third nerve pauses because they never have aberrant re -innovation. So I think there's no axonal loss, just demyelination due to occlusion of one of the, the small vessels, the vasa, the vasa nevorum, and then you have conduction block. So you're just waiting for the nerve to remyelinate. And if you talk to the patients, when they start to recover, it recovers very quickly over days often. And it just depends how long that segment is, how long it's going to take uh, to recover. Um, but um, I, I used to have a three month wait for my clinic. So they were always recovered by the time I saw them. <laughs> Thank you very much. And thanks Dr. Ambika for a wonderful talk. Uh, we shall go on to our next speaker. Our next speaker to follow is Dr. Mahesh Kumar, who would be dealing on targeted investigations in field loss of neuroophthalmic origin. And Dr. Mahesh heads the Department of Neuroophthalmology Services at Arvind Eye Care Systems at Madurai. On to you, Dr. Mahesh Kumar. Good evening. And uh, am I audible? Yeah, you'll have to share your screen. Yes. So good evening, and uh, I would like to thank uh, the AOS ARC uh, team members for uh, um, having invited me here for this uh, to speak in this uh, excellent webinar. So the topic given to me is targeted investigations in uh, visual field testing in neuroophthalmology. So the objectives of my presentation will be to highlight the various field testing strategies in neuroophthalmic disease, and specifically, I will not be discussing the visual field effects in neuroophthalmic disease in this short six minute uh, talk. So um, for, to understand visual field is one of the four uh, cardinal uh, visual sensory functions, the other being acuity, color vision, contrast sensitivity and visual. Needless to say visual field is one of the most important among these four uh, cardinal visual sensory functions. So in order to understand the uh, value of fields in the neuroophthalmology, we need to understand why at all we are doing the visual fields in neuroophthalmology. Basically, we would like to localize the lesion. Uh, we would like to uh, uh, localize it in one of the uh, visual pathways, wherever it is in the tract, in the radiation, or in the occipital cortex, or we need to lateralize the lesion. Uh, so either to the right side or to the left side. Very rarely do we need a quantitation of the uh, visual field defects, unlike glaucoma. Uh, but specifically in a two or three conditions alone, we might need a quantitation like idiopathic follow-up of cases of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, uh, optic neuropathy due to thyroid-related orbitopathy, or when we are following a tumor progression, which are treated medically like uh, pituitary adenoma, in these cases only we might need quantitation. And in several other instances, most other instances, we just need to localize and lateralize the lesion. So based on this, we will see what are the essential visual field testings uh, which we can do in uh, neuroophthalmology in the office setting. Confrontation, Amsler, kinetic and static. And confrontation is one of the most 
uh, underestimated, especially in, in terms of neuroophthalmic disease. Uh, if a simple finger counting or a red target testing will detect more than 75% of the visual field defects in neuroophthalmology because these are all very gross defects and uh, whenever there is a suspicion of visual field defect, always a confrontation field testing should be performed even before a formal visual field testing. And next thing is the Amsler, Amsler grid. Traditionally, it has been taught that Amsler grid is mainly for macular lesions. But remember that a lot of optic nerve lesions, neuroophthalmic disease also cause central vision loss. And a simple Amsler grid can also detect all these central visual field defects. Uh, like for example, a toxic optic neuropathy or even an optic neuritis uh, beginning when it can cause a central vision field defect. This Amsler grid is very useful. A routine kinetic perimetry like a germ screen or um, um, Goldman perimeter, which is very rarely found nowadays, a central uh, germ screen, which measures the central 30 degrees, is uh, useful for most uh, visual field defects in neuroophthalmology. Unlike when we suspect a junctional scotoma, when we might need more uh, peripheral uh, field testings. So, with regard to automated perimetry, uh, there is a fundamental difference between neuroophthalmology and glauco glaucoma field defects. Remember that pattern here in neuroophthalmology pattern rather than light sensitivity uh, uh, as done as detected by the gray scale is more important in neuroophthalmic field defects. And also it's also important to keep the fields side by side uh, so as to detect the pattern because we are in neuroophthalmology we are looking at uh, both eyes field defects simultaneously rather than single eye lesions. So always keep the right to the right side and left to the left side and uh, as, as the patient sees it and detect the field defects. Uh, and uh, in homonymous field defects, uh, we need to look at uh, usually 24-2 field defects uh, would suffice. And in this instance, it's a, a incongruous asymmetric field defect suggestive of an opposite side optic tract lesion. And whenever we suspect uh, these incongruous lesions, we know that the lesion is uh, somewhere in the optic tract and we need to do a neuroimaging for these lesions and uh, also perhaps detect the reason for these uh, field defects like if there is no history of trauma like blood pressure or uh, hyper, uh, hyper uh, lipidemias or diabetic status we need to look at these things. So you can see this asymmetric field defects and the common strategies uh, of automated perimetry are either 30-2 or 24-2. 30-2 uh, is preferred but there is a problem with uh, uh, patient fatigue and 24-2 uh, can be done in most other cases, 30-2 whenever we suspect a peripheral field defect. Uh, when, when is a supra threshold uh, test preferred? Whenever we want to screen the uh, defects, whenever we grossly suspect uh, field defects and in one study the sensitivity and specificity of supra threshold defects, uh, full threshold uh, testing in neuroophthalmology was very high. 87% and 85% and if whenever we need a quick testing or a mass screening uh, supra threshold test would suffice in neuroophthalmic testing. A regular full threshold test is done like a 30-2 or a 24-2 is done whenever there is a high index of suspicion and whenever we follow up the tumor growth and whenever we are monitoring patients in idiopathic intracranial hypertension a full threshold testing is done. So in this instance we can see that can see a bitemporal evolving bitemporal field defect, a threshold test, and obviously a neuroimaging by a magnetic resonance imaging is uh, mandatory in these cases. And a full field uh, testing, if it is done, will also most instances detect uh, field defects. You can see a bitemporal field defect in this instance. So when is a central visual field testing strategy important? Whenever we <coughs> We want to detect a central scotoma whenever the patient's complaints are very vague and we are not able to detect the field defect in conditions like optic neuritis, toxic optic neuropathies like ethambutal toxicity or whenever we suspect a lubus hereditary optic neuropathy uh, when there is a sequential painless vision loss, uh, we, we can do a central 10-2 visual field defect. Why this is more sensitive means because this assesses 68 points in the central 10 degrees which is 5 times. Uh, more than that of a regular 24-2 or 30-2. So this is a targeted visual field testing. Whenever we suspect uh, all these conditions like toxic optic neuropathies or uh, uh, hereditary optic neuropathy. So in summary, 
uh, visual field testing where we, we have to target in, uh, in neuro-ophthalmology by confrontation fields, an Amsler chart in case, Amsler grid in case of a central visual field defect. A regular germ screen can be used for central scotomas or a homonymous or a bitemporal field defects. A Goldman for peripheral field defects and uh, most importantly, a Humphrey field defect, a 10-2 strategy for central or paracentral scotomas. A regular 24-2 or 30-2 for homonymous or bitemporal field defects or junctional field defects. And 120-120 field defects, full field field defects for supra threshold quick screening tests can be done in uh, as Humphrey, Humphrey or any automated perimetry. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot, Dr. Mahesh. You made it a very uh, simple and uh, lots of learning in your talk. Of course, the advantage of doing a 30-2 is also you get your progression analysis and you can uh, uh, get more information. Moodley, could you ask? Yeah, I have a question for Dr. Mahesh and Dr. Rohit. Uh, I mean, is kinetic perimeter commercially available uh, in India? I mean, so... <laughs> we don't know. We don't get it nowadays, kinetic perimetry, especially Goldman, Dr. Rohit. Mm -hmm. I know you have uh, made you have in AIMS uh, kinetic <laughs> perimeter being maintained well. Is that true? Yeah, uh, we are we are uh, using a kinetic perimeter. It is available, but with difficulty. The problem is with the maintenance. Actually, nobody knows how to maintain it, so they may even arrange it for you. But and major problem happens in the slight angulation changes in the light projection light system. So. Now we have tried to actually train our own technician to to you know kind of find the zero error, correct it, and then start a, a field every time. It is available, but I would say now, of course, with so much uh, automated perimetry uh, going on, it is not easily available and maybe not cost for money in a general clinic. Uh, aren't you using uh, octopus kinetic? Uh, sorry. Are you not using the octopus kinetic? Perimeter? Yes, we have used the octopus kinetic also. In fact, we compared uh, the Goldman with the octopus kinetic, uh, either because uh, you know our uh, technicians were better, but we found understanding Goldman perimetry fields uh, far better than the octopus kinetic. But yes, that's an interesting uh, machine, and yeah, short of a Goldman manual Goldman kinetic, the octopus kinetic is also very uh, can be useful. Yeah, I think if you don't have a manual or can't maintain it, uh, you, you do get used to it in time. Right. It has some advantages of the controlled speed and so on. So thanks a lot, Dr. Mayesh Kumar. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, stay on with us and uh, definitely we look forward to your questions too. Our next speaker is Dr. Rashmin Gandhi, who will be dealing on working up of patients with suspected traumatic optic neuropathy. The what, when, and how. So we look forward to hearing from you, Dr. Rashmin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank uh, AIOS, ARC, Dr. Chitra, Murli, and the entire team for inviting me for this presentation. Uh, there are basically three questions in traumatic optic neuropathy. Uh, what investigation would I order? Would it be CT scan or MRI scan? What's the role of uh, electrodiagnostics? And uh, the perennial question, is there any role of steroids in traumatic optoneuropathy? Whether any surgical intervention be useful? Let's look at the first one. Uh, CT versus MRI in the case for, uh, with uh, traumatic optoneuropathy. Well, uh, a lot of times you are looking for fracture of the optic canal and that will show up uh, nicely on CT scan. So CT scan of brain with orbit, uh, fine cuts through orbit. And this is something which has to be mentioned uh, because a lot of times uh, comprehensive ophthalmologists will order for CT scan of brain. Uh, you will be able to see orbit, but it will, uh, because of the change in angulation, you'll not be able to see details. So a CT scan of brain with orbit, fine cuts would uh, be the first uh, investigation of choice. You need to look at the coronal, image, coronal images as well. The MRI will show up the edema of optic nerve and optic nerve sheet enhancement or hemorrhage of the, uh, in the optic nerve sheet. So basically both CT and MRI has a role to play. CT is the investigation of choice, but a lot, lot of times to rule out uh, retrobulbar hemorrhage in the optic nerve sheet or the edema of the optic nerve, you end up uh, uh, requesting for MRI with uh, contrast as well. So that's about the CT versus MRI. What's the role of VEP? Well, uh, 
there is enough evidence and intuitively you know that if VEP is, is normal on presentation, you know that probably the prognosis for improvement in those patients is not very good. However, there has been a paper from Chandigarh about a couple of decades ago where they said that even a flat VEP on presentation in patients with a traumatic optic neuropathy, they did see some improvement later on uh, as the disease progressed. Uh, but by and large, uh, and as this paper suggested, VEP amplitude, which I'll, uh, you require at least 50% uh, uh, of uh, amplitude compared to the normal eye for a good visual outcome. So would I do VEP in all patients who comes to me for, with traumatic optic neuropathy? The other important angle that we need to uh, remember in these patients is that a lot of these patients would end up having a medical legal aspect, a traumatic optic and VEP would be a good documentation in those patients. Now, coming to the third question about the treatment. So is there any evidence-based treatment in patients with traumatic optic neuropathy? Well, the, the short answer is no. A long answer is yes, maybe, could be. So let's look at all the papers which, uh, which have studied this aspect of the treatment. This was a paper by Alfredo Sadur and Group uh, in 1996. They studied 58 patients with traumatic optic neuropathy. There were 10 patients who were observed, 23 were treated with corticosteroids, and 25 had both optic canal decompression and corticosteroids. And the third group, who had both the intervention, actually had a, the most visual improvement versus 10 patients who were observed, they didn't see any improvement in those patients. So if you look at this paper in isolation and say, oh, you have to intervene in all patients with traumatic optic neuropathy and both surgery and steroids have role to play. <clears throat> this is Len Levin and uh, the International Optic Nerve Trauma Study, which actually didn't do well because of uh, uh, less recruitment of patients. And their conclusion was there is sufficient evidence to conclude that neither of uh, the, the treatment modality is can be considered as standard of care. So since 1990, there are more than 16 major studies which have been done in traumatic optomyopathy, most of them had uh, some flaws and that's because of the nature of the disease, variable weak design, retrospective, small sample sizes, no controls, non-standardized outcomes. And what happened in these studies? Well, uh, these are the studies where they proclaim that some form of uh, intervention improved uh, the outcome and there is a wide variability. You, you see the percentages are wide telling you that there is no consensus. The similar kind of um, percentages were observed even in the group where they said that observation alone is, uh, is sufficient. Keeping that in mind, I would like to emphasize on these two studies. This is by uh, Kenneth uh, Steinsiper. It was a study done in the labs. <clears throat> the conclusion, uh, they had divided uh, these uh, animals into five groups. One group received only saline and then they had a progressive increase of the steroid doses. And what they concluded is that there was a greatest number of external survival in patients who did not receive steroids. And as the dose of steroids increased, the external survival reduced. So if you look at this lab study, it tells you that higher dose steroids actually might be reducing the external survival at the end of six weeks. A similar kind of conclusion was in this uh, crash trial, which ac actually had to be abandoned where there is a mega dose steroid which was given in patients with the head injury and they found it was an increased risk of death within two weeks in patients who received uh, these steroids versus compared with placebo. One minute. And, yeah, I'll conclude with uh, this patient just to highlight the importance of history and clinical examination which cannot be replaced and this was shared with me by Dr. Navin J. Kumar where he uh, had seen a patient who came to him for a second opinion. Uh, the history was there was a repeated uh, uh, injury to the head and eyesight gradually fell down. And this is how the optic nerves looked like. But because there was a gradually progressive loss of vision, he went ahead and did the MRI and actually it showed presence of pituitary adenoma. Went ahead and saw the optic disc and saw that there is a surely a pale disc on the affected side, but there are also a, a bow tie kind of optic atrophy on the other side, uh, telling you that there was a chiasmal compression. So in other words, vision loss, the history of vision loss and optic nerve function tests are of paramount importance in all these patients. To summarize, it's a clinical diagnosis. Life-threatening and globe-threatening injuries would be handled first. Surgical indications are limited. Uh, Risk-benefit ratio of steroids, megadose steroids, I think is no-no. No clear evidence-based recommendation can be given and no standard of care actually is established. I thank you once again.
so after you have uh, given your thank you very much your talk was amazing but after you gave your talk i still don't understand one thing what is your regimen for giving steroids in traumatic optic injury and what is your criteria for optic uh, canal decompression yeah. if there is a fracture so as i said uh, not only you nobody understands uh, traumatic optic neuropathy to actually give a, a standardized or to give evidence based medicine, uh, evidence based recommendation what is being followed uh, by a lot of us would be if the patient comes in uh, acute phase and now how acute again there is debatable but let's say patient comes in first 8 hours or first 24 hours he end up ends up getting iv steroids 1 gram no mega dose 1 gram 3 uh, to 5 days followed by oral steroids patient comes within one week with guarded prognosis again he gets 1 gram steroids after one week uh, role of steroids seems to be debatable though there have there have been anecdotal cases where even a steroid after one week uh, had shown some improvement but you have to also understand that a lot of these patients have spontaneous recovery uh, up to one third or more would have a spontaneous recovery so it's very difficult to prove whether steroids caused that recovery or whether there was a spontaneous recovery as far as the surgical intervention is concerned there has been a recent paper in indian journal of ophthalmology by dr kasturi from assam so she has been doing this optic canal decompression uh, navigation guided optic canal decompression and around i think Uh, she published around 30 or 32 patients and she has proclaimed a good recovery of vision with optic canal decompression even in the absence of a bone fragment sitting on the optic nerve uh, and her theory is that because it's navigation guided it's more controlled and it relieves that edema at uh, the narrowest part of the orbit and uh, whatever vision which is lost because of edema of the optic nerve recovers so uh, let's talk about the confusion if i may can i take a second here I'll add to the confusion. In 2018, there was a study in Iran, a very well-designed and prospective study of 52 patients who were given erythropoietin IV in the first few days following the trauma, and the outcomes. And this was three days of IV erythropoietin, and the outcomes at the end of one month, three months, six months, was just similar to corticosteroids IV, or even observation. this is called the traumatic optic neuropathy treatment trial so any other questions to ask or shall i go on to our next speaker that was a very nice brief talk by you dr rashmin was very informative as what we can't do our next speaker in this section is dr jyoti matalia who would be talking on ocular myasthenia gravis diagnosis and management she is a senior consultant in pediatrics and neuro ophthalmology department of nara netralia hospitals with a brilliant academic career and innumerable teaching winning videos up her sleeve besides many more of her achievements on to you doctor thank you can you hear me yeah yeah so at the outset i'd like to thank aios arc and dr chitra for this opportunity I'll be talking on ocular myasthenia diagnosis and management. Talking first about what it is, the definition, the pathophysiology, why it is important in terms of the diagnostic steps and management. So let's come to the diagnosis. So we are aware it's an autoimmune disease that affects the neuromuscular junction and primarily important for ophthalmologists because it affects the orbicularis oculi muscles, the extraocular muscles that you can see here, and the levator. right so why it's important to know the pathophysiology is because our next steps are going to be on based of this so as we are aware the acetylcholine the neurotransmitter which is released at the uh, uh, the junctions that binds to the receptors of the muscles and results in contracture but in myasthenia there is presence of acetylcholine receptor antibodies which bind to these receptors and result in their destruction that's one another important aspects are the presence of the muscle specific kinase and the lpr lrp4 which is important for normal clustering of these receptors and if that is destroyed by antibodies which tends to happen in uh, myasthenia that will result in destruction of the receptors and both these form the basis of the diagnostic tests so what are the tests then we'll classify them into these five groups first the clinical very important variability so history as which is very important neuro ophthal is mandatory you have to ask the diurnal variation that happens the classically present with ptosis which could be unilateral or bilateral diplopia any form of cranial neuropathy when doesn't fit into the normal routine should be thought of myasthenia 
that so patient can present with diplopia and most importantly pupils are normal in these cases then the important test that is a fatigue test where when you ask the patient to look up Upwards, a sustained up gaze will cause the ptosis to worsen. And then the pathognomic test, the Kogan's lit twitch test, which means if you make the patient look from down gaze to up gaze, you'll see the sudden twitch that tends to happen in the eyes. After that comes the important other tests in the clinic. One is the eyes test, simple and very effective. After giving lies, applying eyes for about two to uh, five minutes, you'll see an improvement in the ptosis. The sleep test, which or the rest test, which allows resolution of the ptosis or ocular motility after 30 minutes. Then the short-acting and long-acting anticholinesterase treatment, which you give to see the sudden improvement in the ptosis. This has a sen sensitivity of 95% in GMG, but only 86% in ocular myosin. Then coming to the important serological test, this, yes, acetylcholine receptor antibodies, more specific. But normal titers does not exclude a disease. It is more, more so for the generalized myasthenia, but for ocular, only 50% tend to have positive tests. The others are musk antibodies and the LRP4 antibodies. However, remember that 10% of cases of ocular myasthenia can have triple negative, means all three antibodies absent. Then comes the electrophysiological test. Yes, the single fiber EMG, which is the most sensitive, but not very specific and more so for the generalized myasthenia and the repetitive nerve stimulation study. And other tests that are important is the CT chest, uh, CT chest to rule out thymic hyperplasia, thymoma, and also do uh, thyroid function tests. So when you have uh, done these tests, finally we plan the management, which depends on two ways. One, is there any treatment which increases the acetylcholine availability at the junction? And secondly, prevents acetylcholine receptor binding with the antibodies. And that is done with pharmacological agents. Yes, pyridone, uh, pyridostigmine or mestinone, which is a prototype drug, an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, which causes prolongation of the action of acetylcholine. So the first level of principle works here. It does not affect the natural disease course, but works only in 20 to 40% of patients with ocular disease. Then corticosteroids, which is a second line of treatment and should be given along with pyridosicamine. So if you have a patient with OMG, you can give both simultaneously. It can give about 80% of relief or the clinical symptoms. And finally, the immunotherapeutic agents, which are reserved for those when corticosteroids risk exceeds the benefit. It reduces the risk of developing generalized myasthenia and it changes the natural course of the disease. A study by Sai Sommer et al. showed that 12% of OMG patients develop GMG as against 64% who are not on immunosuppressants, which could be either because of late reflux or uncertain diseases. So what are these agents? Yes, azathioprine, which works both for ocular and generalized, but has its side effects. Then mycophenolate morphetil, which is more effective in ocular myasthenia. And these two sets, which are primarily for the generalized myasthenia. Surgical options are reserved for those which are more commonly for generalized myasthenia, where we are looking at a presence of thymoma, and in those which are zero positive cases, if they are not responding to treat, medical treatment, can also benefit, but not more than 50% of those with ocular myasthenia. So then, to summarize, you have to look at a clinical examination, eyes test, sleep test, fatigue test, rule out generalized symptoms or any alternative disease. If that clinically proves ocular myasthenia, yes, go and do the antibody testing. As mentioned, acetylcholine receptor antibodies are only positive in 50%. If negative, then the mask antibodies, but they are positive only in 5%. NLRP4 antibodies in 20% if the above two antibodies are missing. If they are zero negative, then you go to the electrodiagnostics, uh, which is the RNS. And there's a decrement more than 10% from the first and the fourth um, action potential, then it's significant. And the single fiber EMG, look for the abnormal jitter. Though not pathognomic, is definitely significant and intermittent Im impulse blocking. If this is consistent or if antibody testing is zero positive, then we are reaching the diagnosis of OMG. But if negative, then we have to look at other causes like MRI, find out something else and it may not be myasthenia or consider empirical treatment. It may respond, that also confirms it. And repeat antibody testing, which may come positive after six to 12 months, which finally would give us the confirmation. Hence to summarize, remember that myasthenia is a clinical diagnosis. It's a great mimicker. So any patient who has a ptosis or diplopia, especially with normal pupils, suspect OMG always. Remember that importance should be given to the history of variability and fatigability. 
don't get biased by diagnosis elsewhere always treat it as a fresh patient and treat it right starting from the scratch with a good history and examination and always coordinate with the neurologist because many a times this could not be purely ocular in about 50 to 60% patients develop generalized but remember that if more than 2 years of patient having purely ocular symptoms may not uh, go into uh, generalized myasthenia but always best to coordinate with the neurologist so thank you for your patient listening thank you dr jyoti that was a wonderful talk and that's nothing less is expected from you and um, since you say serology is going to be uh, only 50% effective in ocular myasthenia i just wanted to know would you think of doing an imaging of the mediastinum for a thymoma in these cases or you would not so i would uh, as i said in case of ocular myasthenia i'm not very very uh, if you're purely looking at an ocular cause i'm not really very keen in cases which are not responding on medical treatment i would really look for but if i'm forwarding this patient to a general uh, to a neurologist then they always would look for uh, uh, thymoma dr murli Muli, you are muted. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Satyakarna and Dr. Gordon. Uh, actually, it has been said that steroids, uh, even though they are first line in uh, myasthenia gravis with ophthalmoplegia, they can produce a transient uh, initial worsening. So some people actually start with a low dose of steroid and then increase it and then taper it down to the uh, minimal uh, dose that is effective. Uh, so is that the way to go that you start with a low dose and then increase it so that you don't get the initial transient worsening? and how important is it in uh, ocular myasthenia gravis because uh, worsening of condition in generalized myasthenia gravis would be bad so you would not like to start with a high dose of oral steroids but uh, for ocular myasthenia gravis how important is it? you want to answer <laughs> <laughs> yeah go ahead i i think that um it depends a little bit how long the patient has had symptoms because we know that the symptoms have been purely ocular uh, for certainly for two years, it, it becomes very unlikely that it would become generalized. So, so there, there isn't that risk. Um, and, and so you can, uh, but I usually, any, I, I, I don't usually start people on uh, a milligram per kilogram straight, straight away anyway. I build up the dose. But um, if, they, if they've only had ocular symptoms for a matter of weeks, they could become generalized uh, very rapidly. And there I would be more cautious and probably admit the patient uh, to start them on steroids if that's what I was doing at that point. But usually with, with, with purely ocular, um, it's, you're quite a long way down the line before you start using steroids, corticosteroids anyway. Um, so the, the, and if, if there's a transient worsening of uh, purely ocular myasthenia, it, it's not going to be a disaster. Do you agree, Dr. Battaglia? Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, there is one study called as Epitome study, where they've studied the efficacy of uh, prednisolone in the use of uh, ocular myasthenia. And they have started with five milligram and gradually increased every five days to see whether you get the effect. And they found that in they have separated with placebo, zero of placebo out of five and uh, so out of six and five of the six patients who got uh, uh, prednisolone got a significant improvement. And they finally found that 50 milligram per day was a good dose because they started increasing it and they titrated to this value. So if you want to get a good relief of symptoms, 15 milligram per day is what they found as an uh, effective uh, dose for treating these patients. And once you get a resolution, then you gradually start tapering them. And, and so but if you're really sure it's purely ocular, you can, you can escalate the dose as tolerated, I think, uh, and as an outpatient. Um, but if there's any question that it, it might be generalized or any evidence that it is generalized, then, then, then you, you have to be more cautious. With regard to thymic imaging, um, do remember that, that there are thymic carcinomas. Um, and um, uh, I, think that, I think that all patients with myasthenia should have mediastinal imaging. And, and the, the problem we have with the trials is that like Newsom Davis trial of uh, thymectomy, which was finally done. Uh, sadly, he died before it was uh, finished, but um, uh, un unfortunately they, they've always excluded ocular myasthenia uh, from those trials. Uh, they've only looked at generalized myasthenia. So we don't really have, uh, ha have the evidence, um, but um, I, I think that thymomas do need to be removed. Uh, partly because ultimately they'll cause other problems, 
they're also associated with other autoimmune diseases. One of my patients, um, uh, I, he had a tiny thymoma and, and I just thought I'd monitor it. And he developed red cell aplasia. It's terrifying. You, you make no, no red cells at all. You make, uh, and, and his hemoglobin dropped by a gram every day uh, in that situation. Uh, so, uh, so thymomas not only cause problems locally, they also are associated with a lot of other autoimmune diseases, which can be very serious. And, and occasionally they're carcinomas. Um, so, so I think everyone with myasthenia should have mediastinal imaging. Uh, and as you're saying, that's what the neurologists would say as well. Thank you very much, doctor. Thanks a lot, Dr. Jyoti. So we shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Ari Varagan, a very eminent professor of neurosurgery in Nimhans, Bangalore, with special interest in neuroendoscopy, neurooncology, functional neurosurgery. He would be speaking for the debate session, I vouch for shunting procedures. We all look forward to some amazing insights to neuroophthalmic aspects of neuro neurology from him. He is to be contested by another very prolific surgeon, Dr. Sachin Kedar, who would be talking on the safety and simplicity of optic nerve sheet decompression. And Dr. Sachin is a professor of the Department of Neurological Sciences, Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, Program Director of the Residency Program of Neuroophthalmology and Ocular Electrophysiology. So on to you, Dr. Arivara. Uh, good evening. I'm just uh, trying to share the screen. It's not... Uh... Yeah, uh, uh, good evening. Is my is my screen visible? No. Yes, it is. Yes. No. Yeah, no, just a minute. Just a minute. It was. Yes. Yeah. Is it is it seen now? Yes. Yeah. Good, good evening, everyone. It's a uh, it's a privilege and honor to be invited into a uh, into another uh, society uh, to share my thoughts and i thank dr murali to uh, given this chance and uh, let me uh, tell in a few minutes uh, my understanding or uh, of uh, this topic i will be talking about the use of shunts in idiopathic intracranial hypertension and uh, this idiopathic intracranial hypertension diagnosis itself, uh, as well as the pathophysiology, is not at clear, though we know it for more than a century. Uh, how it happens uh, exactly is not clear. It may be either because of increased CSF production or reduced drainage, or it can sometimes be also postulated that because of increased venous pressure, venous sinus pressure, because of focal or diffuse venous sinus stenosis. And of course, we also know that the obesity and other uh, inflammatory factors can. Uh, contribute to the cause. And then uh, various uh, diet criteria have been devised. The more latest one is 2013 modified dentist criteria, wherein a patient should have a papilledema with normal neurological examination and normal neuroimaging with normal venogram and uh, lumbar puncture being more than 25 centimeters of, of water. So I'm going to talk, the topic given to me is uh, shunt versus optic nerve sheet penetration. And I'm not going to be stupid to come into a ophthalmology conference to say that your procedure you do is not good. I don't look at it that way. Uh, does it always have to be like this, uh, one versus another, or, or both procedures can work symbiotically to give the best for a patient? So what is the evidence uh, to choose between these two procedures? What do we have as of now? There are no randomized control trials. There are no prospective comparative data, no large scale studies. And all the inferences from meta-analysis literature reviews of retrospective studies. So these are the four major papers that I could find to compare the uh, outcomes of these two procedures in intracranial uh, idiopathic hypertension. Uh, most of them are uh, meta-analysis and systematic literature review. And you can see two, or two out of four are from the same group. Uh, so if you look at the data that's available to us, this is a paper from two, in 2017 where they compared the outcomes of all the four procedures, optic nerve sheet penetration, lumbar peritoneal shunt, VP shunt, and sinus scenting. If you look at the number of patients, they are fairly equal. And if you look at the outcome, uh, the improvement in visual field and visual equity is almost comparable to among the three. The headache improves better with the shunting than uh, uh, with only optic nerve fenestration. And uh, like you can see, 
But what's more important is to look at the complication. I'm sure uh, my colleague, Dr. Kedav, is going to talk more on that. Yes, I agree. The, the, among the complications, optic nerve sheath transition is obviously less, uh, has less complication compared to the shunts. I'll come compared to the shunts. Uh, if you look further into the complication, this, this slide would uh, give you more detailed understanding. Most of the complications that happen with shunt are basically hardware related. These shunts are mechanical tubes. They can get blocked. They can get migrated. And they can also cause over drainage. And there are some incidents of infection, which is obviously there in any procedure. And this is the latest paper which came this month in 2021, mm -hmm. uh, which again uh, has compared or studied all the uh, major studies. And as you see, the headache improves better with shunting. Visual field and visual acuity improvement is comparable across the uh, uh, three procedures. And if you look at the complications, the shunt has obviously a more, uh, more severe complication here. The incidence of meningitis is taken as severe complication. Of course, when you deal with a procedure which enters uh, subarachnoid space and CSF, and there's always a risk of infection, uh, which is not there in uh, optic nerve penetration. Also, there's a 0.3% of mortality with shunts. And uh, as what I said and what I saw in the papers, there's no documented mortality with optic nerve penetration. But let's put this in perspective. These uh, shunts are basically subcutaneous procedure. It's uh, if when you come to lumbar pedal shunt, it's basically placing a, placing a catheter into the lumbar space. It's like doing a lumbar puncture and then a, uh, uh, tunneling the catheter subcutaneously and placing the pedal cavity. Uh, ventricular pedal shunt in IH is slightly more difficult because there are uh, the ventricles are slit like in this IH, whereas in regular patients where we do hydro or obstetric hydrocephalus, ventricles are dilated. And uh, as of now, we have more uh, uh, better technology of. Uh, programmable shunts, which can take care of this over drainage problems. And therefore that uh, has become a less of a uh, issue as far as uh, uh, complications or side effect of the shunts are concerned. Mm -hmm. So let, let us look at these uh, two procedures in the perspective, what we see in the general practice. If you look at the, this paper, which has talked about the use of shunt versus optic nerve sheath penetration from 2012 to 2016, the large uh, number of shunts have been done compared to optic nerve sheath penetrations. Uh, about 10,000 odd shunts compared to 300 translations. And this is the consensus guidelines of management uh, from UK, which has been critically reviewed by various societies of neurologists, ophthalmologists, and neurosurgeons. It says the best surgical procedure for visual loss as of now is uh, CSF diversion. Of course, you ONSF is performed more frequently, and it can be considered as other procedure. So uh, there is no data to, of superiority of one over the other. Indications can be subject or symptom specific. It will definitely be influenced by local practice and expertise available. So, uh, uh, but if you look at the uh, indication, the optic nerve sheath penetration is preferred in patients who have got visual deterioration as the only symptom. And uh, whereas if a patient has both headache and visual deterioration, then CSF diversion is preferred as a uh, uh, first procedure to do it. Venous sinus stenting is often considered where you can identify a focal stenosis and show a more than 8 millimeter mercury pressure difference. So uh, to conclude, shunt is useful and when indicated, I'm going to steal the tagline of the next talk, which is simpler and safer. I would say that shunt is simpler because every neurosurgeon can do the shunt procedure. It's one of the first procedure that a neurosurgical trainee uh, learns and starts doing. It's typically uh, technically simple, like uh, doing a lumbar puncture and then it's safe. I won't call it safer because the, the comparative risk of complications is more with the shunt, obviously, because of a hardware involvement. And uh, it, in it in involves high rate of shunt revisions, but that's inherent to this procedure. And even if there's a shunt revision, it can be still safely performed. And uh, with the programmable uh, t copetal and VP, VP shunts, uh, drainage can be controlled and uh, over drainage can be avoided. And we know that how shunt works. It has a well-established mechanism of action by draining the CSR from the brain and reducing the intracranial pressure. Thank you. On to you, Dr. Sachin. Wonderful talk. Dr. Sachin, could you share your screen? Yes. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Arivalgan. Uh, that was a nice uh, presentation for uh, CSF uh, uh, shunt procedures. I would prefer optic nerve sheath fenestration for my patients, but as you correctly indicated, 
It depends on what the patient presents with. These are my conflicts of interest, but the most important one is that I'm no longer a surgeon. I do not do either of those two procedures. And so my opinion is going to be unbiased based on outcomes and on the pathophysiology. So let me start with a usual case presentation, something that we see at least a few times in our clinic. A 27 year old morbidly obese female who presents with worsening headache and blurred vision with pulse synchronous tinnitus and TVOs. On examination, she has markedly reduced visual acuity and color vision and horrendous papilledema as you can see in the pictures. The visual fields show significant constriction and reduction in both eyes. You get an MRI which shows partially empty cella, posterior globe flattening, and MRV which shows non-thrombotic transverse sinus stenosis. CSF opening pressure is significantly elevated at 600 millimeters of water. Contents are normal. And as Dr. Plant identified in the US, we start at 1,000 milligrams a day with a rapid escalation planned to four grams per day. But she returns in five days with worse visual activity, worse color vision, worse visual fields, and she's unable to go up beyond two grams per day because of the significant side effects, which Dr. Padmaja identified as well in her practice. The question now is, you have this patient, five days later, acute papilledema, worsening visual functions, what will you do? To me, the answer is obvious. I would prefer optic nerve sheet fenestration over a CSF shunt procedure at this time, even though I have the ability to have access to both kinds of surgeons. Let me start by pointing out why I think so based on the mechanism of action and the pathophysiology. We all know that the ICP is transmitted equally across all contiguous subarachnoid space. So, you know, if the CSF pressure is high up here, it's going to be transmitted along the optic nerve sheet. But what you have to understand is that the ophthalmic effect is secondary to a local optic nerve head pathology. We know from the studies that Dr. Hare did many years ago in uh, the UK actually, where he showed that increased CSF pressure may lead to ballooning of the optic nerve sheet, which now acts as an expansile vessel. We see these effects on MRI in the form of posterior globe flattening or optic nerve ectasia or on OCT, where studies have clearly demonstrated bowing of the, uh, the Brooks membrane in the peripapillary region. So when the CSF optic nerve sheath balloons out, it causes a mechanical effect by compressing the axons, compressing the blood vessels, leading to vasomotor instability, intraneuronal ischemia, and axonal death. We also know from studies done by Hans-Peter Killer many years ago, that in patients with papilledema, there might be a change in the CSF physiology within the optic nerve sheath itself. It is possible that there is reduced CSF turnover, as you can see in patients without papilledema and with papilledema, and the CSF, concentrate, uh, CSF composition is changed with some inflammatory components uh, as well. A few years ago, some of my students did a histopathologic study of the optic nerve sheath itself and found on light microscopy that there is increased cellularity. And on electron microscopy, you can see marked irregularity and disruption of the collagen compared to controls. So what this tells us is there's a lot going on right there at the optic nerve head. Now let's come to the performance of optic nerve sheet fenestration. And uh, as Dr. Arivalan uh, uh, presented, the, the results are really good. Uh, most studies show that there is better than 90% improved visual outcomes in series. Even if you do one eye, there is improvement of fellow eye in at least 50 to 60% of cases. And even in patients who have a functioning shunt procedure and progressive vision loss, going ahead and doing a optic nerve sheet fenestration can preserve their vision. And as a bonus, about half of these patients may obtain headache relief. 
The adverse effects are there. It's a surgical procedure, but they're mostly minor. The severe visual loss, which is a dreaded complication, is rare. Importantly, the survival rates of fenestration are about 75% at six months, 66% at one year, and 38% at five years. And I think that is comparable to CSF shunt procedures as well. As Dr. Ivargan pointed out, there is a hardware involved in CSF shunt procedures. Do I recommend my patients to get it done? Yes, but with the understanding that you may have to go in and redo the surgery. With optic nerve sheet fenestration, you can get immediate success because you're decompressing the optic nerve sheet right where the pathology occurs. So what happened to our patient? About eight weeks after fenestration surgery, the visual acuity improved quite dramatically. The optic nerve swelling reduced quite dramatically. And as you can see, the visual fields are also much, much better. So thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions for the debate. Thank you very much, Dr. Mudli. Just one question. We have six more speakers. Yeah, uh, I have a question for uh, Dr. Arivaragan. I mean, uh, can you find out on MRI whether a shunt, a LP shunt or a VP shunt is working or uh, it is dysfunctional? Is it possible to do that? Uh, MR, MR, is not the, MR is not the best investigation to decide whether a shunt is working in idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Of course, if you are, if you are, do, if you are doing a shunt for some other, other uh, conditions where there's a dilated ventricles, then uh, a, a CT scan imaging will show. Whereas here, the patient's Im imaging is most often normal, where the ventricles are already small. So when you put a shunt, it's going to be symptomatic improvement. And the assessment of papilledema and resolution of papilledema and the improvement of visual acuity. And if it was a, if it is a VP shunt, if, if when we put a VP shunt, there is a chamber uh, which is present behind the ear, where we do a, what is called a shunt tap. Uh, when there is a doubt, we can do a shunt tap where you put a needle into the chamber and aspirate CSF and check whether the proximal tube and the distal tube is functioning. Uh, so in case of VP shunt, we can do this procedure, which is basically subcutaneous needle insertion and check. But imaging in intracranial idiopathic hypertension will not help to tell you whether a shunt is working or not. But it's it's primarily the patient's clinical improvement, both at of the uh, visual uh, equity uh, level as well as the resolution of papillary edema. So Sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a different talk, a different, different topic. I will not get into that. Question for Dr. Sachin, would you do it unilaterally or bilaterally? It, de it depends on the amount of visual loss uh, and the degree of papilledema. If it is asymmetrical, then one side, but if it is severe central vision loss and severe papilledema, like in our patients on both sides, where you saw that within five days, the vision has gone down, uh, you, you know, our surgeons will do bilateral. Thank you. We shall can now. I ask, uh, sorry, I mean, can I ask a question? Uh, whatever I read, uh, I understood that the pathophysiology of the optic nerve sheet fenestration is not clear. Uh, is that what? That's what I found in literature. Maybe am I wrong, or we have a clarity on how it works? Uh, the pathophysiology of IIH, yes, that is still unclear. Correct. Thank you. Paucity of time. We have to go. We have six great speakers. So our next. Uh, speaker in the section on consensus on controversies is Dr. Padmaja Sudhakar, who's a senior consultant in UK healthcare doing specialty work in multiple sclerosis, neuroimmunology, neuroophthalmology, and neurology at her advanced eye care center. She's going to be talking to us on how has the management of optic neuritis changed over time, a very important topic, and we look forward to hearing from you. Good evening. I thank the uh, organizers for inviting me. So uh, optic neuritis, we all know, is inflammation of the optic nerve. And it comes from multiple etiologies, depending on which the visual prognosis and the recurrences vary. If you ask the one question, has the management of optic neuritis changed? Yes, because today we have these new pathological glial antibodies. That's your aquaporin, IgG4 antibody, the MOG antibody, and the glial fibrillary acidic protein antibody. So today, Optic nerve during the inflammation can be used to rapidly identify disease-relevant autoimmune targets, deliver timely therapeutics to improve visual outcome, and determine future neurologic disability. The first step is we need to know the difference between typical and atypical optic neuritis. 
Atypical optic neuritis is the one associated with MS. Atypical requires the testing for the new pathological antibodies. Distinguishing the two at initial presentation is very hard. They have very distinct clinical and radiological features, different outcomes, so they require slightly different treatment. What are the red flags for your atypical optic neuritis? Someone with a severe visual impairment less than 2400, think about NMO and MOG, because typical optic neuritis is usually 2200 or better. Bilateral optic neuritis is more common in children, MOG, and NMO. The ONTT taught us that 95% had unilateral vision loss in their series of typical optic neuritis. Recurrent optic neuritis is another red flag. Poor visual recovery. If you don't see at least one line of visual imp improvement within three weeks of onset, that case could be atypical. Prominent disc edema, idiopathic optic neuritis or typical optic neuritis, less than 25% have disc edema. So if you see significant disc inflammation, hemorrhages, ocular inflammation, think infection, think MOG. And then signs of area postrema syndrome with nausea, vomiting, and hiccups, think about NMO. MRI can give you a lot of clues. So if you have a bilateral optic neuritis, which is longitudinally extensive, involving both uh, extensive retrobulbar optic nerves, that can be NMO or MOG, usually MOG. If you have more than 50% of the retrobulbar optic nerve involvement, more posterior involvement, involvement of the optic chiasm or the tract, think about NMO. If you have a perineural teeth enhancement and orbital fat stranding, that can be MOG, Neuritis, you also have to think about syphilis. And of course, in India, you have to think about TB. The MRI can give you other clues. It can pick up your MS lesions. Similarly, you can have lesions in the spinal cord. But if you see lesions in the preependymal location in the fornix and hypothalamus, think about NMO. A longitudinally extensive lesion in the spinal cord, we all know that we have to think about NMO or MOG. But remember that MOG involves the lower cord and the corners. Similarly, you do not see inflammation of meninges in your demyelinating optic neuritis. So that will suggest granulomatous disease or infection. CSF can give you clues. Mild pheocytosis with less than 56 can be, uh, sorry, less than 50 cells could be your typical optic neuritis. But if you have more than 100 cells, think about MOG. If you see eosinophils and PMNs in the CSF, that would be NMO. And oligoclonal bands, very typical for MS. So how do we treat? The ONTT taught us that IV methylprednisolone for three days followed by oral prednisone for 11 days accelerated visual recovery in optic neuritis but failed to improve final visual outcomes. Even today, we treat optic neuritis with IV methylprednisolone, but we give a gram daily for three to five days. And then subsequent studies shows that a corticosteroid equivalent 1,000 milligrams IV methylprednisolone can also give accelerated recovery. In fact, they've even used intramuscular or subcutaneous ACTH. Oral prednisone is a no-no in typical optic neuritis because it increases your relapse. But if you have sarcoid optic neuritis or cryon, you can use low-dose oral prednisone. Similarly, ONTT taught us that IV methylprednisolone delayed conversion to MS in the first two years. But when the study participants were reclassified, this was not true. Similarly, it did not even reduce the relapse rates as was originally thought. So what happens when you have optic neuritis refractory to steroids? Then you go for IV immunoglobulin or plasma exchange. Now, IVIG did not improve visual outcome according to some studies. Plasma exchange can improve visual outcome in corticosteroid refractory optic neuritis or optic neuritis associated with NMO. Increased response seen in male sex, those with lower baseline disability and where there's a rapid initiation of treatment. If you have an NMO patient where you know you're going to have poor visual recovery and recurrent optic neuritis, go for plasma exchange straight away as the first line treatment. Usually give five sessions. And if you have optic neuritis which has failed methylprednisolone in the past or it's a recurrent optic neuritis of NMO and MOG, you can even do a combination of methylprednisolone and plasma exchange. And finally, make an attempt to diagnose your MS, NMO, or MOG. 
because once you know it, you know that you have to give them long-term immune suppression. So they have to be now managed by a neuroimmunologist or a neurologist. So in conclusion, if you have typical optic neuritis, this is self-limited with a strong chance of recovery. But atypical, you can have more severe vision loss and they can recur without prophylactic treatment. So clinicians must differentiate the two you must give aggressive anti-inflammatory therapy and targeted immune suppression to minimize the short and long-term visual loss from optic neuritis. And I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Padmaja. That was a very succinct talk. Uh, a question to Dr. Pradeep Sharma or Dr. Rohit. Is uh, multiple sclerosis a less common cause of optic neuritis in India compared to West or? So... I, think, I would say it otherwise. I would say that proportionately, uh, NMO is a higher uh, uh, percentage-wise in Indian population as compared to the West. So studies from uh, Lakey Pandit from Mangalore have shown that up to 20% of uh, optic neuritis would be NMO positive, which is definitely higher than what has been reported from the West. But uh, I would say that, I mean, that's why I would say, and the other thing, of course, we have a lot of infectious causes, which are very important. So, so proportionately, optic neuritis due to MS may be proportionately less as compared to the West because the other factors are significantly important in our uh, circumstance. Sir. Uh, Murli, any questions before you go on to our next speaker? Yeah, I have a question for Dr. Ambika, and uh, I mean, anybody can answer. Uh, so considering that uh, doing anti-MOG and anti-NMO in every case considerably adds on to the cost because you have to get the cell-based assays uh, done, uh, is it possible uh, to guide these investigations uh, radiologically, at least in the Indian uh, scenario, as to what uh, you would do? Like, if the MRI is very typical of MS, maybe you could, uh, you need not do these two. Uh, any thoughts? I think that's correct. I mean, but but uh, we're we're much better now at, at diagnosing uh, MS on uh, on MRI because of the um, uh, the more precise criteria over the characteristics of the lesions um, next to the peel surface, uh, following venules and uh, and so on. We've got m many more criteria now, and I think um, if you if you do make an accurate diagnosis of MS on on imaging, there is no need to do the other um, tests, and unless there's something else uh, unusual about it. We have some overlap cases that look like MS and have NMO antibodies, but they're relatively unusual. Um, I've always um, been unhappy with the, the terms typical and atypical for the reasons that you're, 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 <laughs> you're talking about now, um, because it depends uh, the age of the patient, the gender of the patient, and where you are in the world, what's typical. In Thailand, uh, MS is something like 5% of optic neuritis. Um, it, so so um, uh, we, we're actually just, just introducing a, a, trying to introduce a new optic neuritis classification, which takes this into account. And it, it, it means that people will call, if you use it, rather than talking about atypical, typical, you, you either talk about idiopathic, you don't know the cause, or you give the cause. It's MS, it's NMO, it's MOG. Uh, whatever you've found. And I think that's, um, it's a lot safer to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, we shall now go on to our next speaker. In this section is Dr. Anbarsu, who would be talking on angiography in neuroophthalmology, CTA versus MRA versus DSA, differences, pros and cons explained. He's a consultant radiologist and clinical director at the University Hospital Coventry and Warwickshire. Editor of Oxford Handbook of Head and Neck Imaging, has published innumerable reviewed articles and holds on risk posts. On to you, Doctor. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Shetra Ramuthi. It's very kind of you and the Eye Foundation team who has asked me to speak. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, let me just start straight away. Um, Okay. 
Yes, I can just uh, scroll. Can you just talk and share again? Okay, so let's uh, go on to discuss this CTA and uh, MRA and DSA in orbital imaging. Um, um, the CTA is the CT angiogram and MRA angiogram and digital subtraction angiogram. Uh, what is CT angiogram? This is uh, sort of a basic things uh, needed for the residents and the new consultants. Uh, for a CT angio, we need an IV contrast which will be injected via peripheral venflon. Uh, in a peripheral vein, contrast is injected using a pump with the suitable pressure, and we know how much is injected by using the flow controls per second. Uh, it takes approximately approximately 15 seconds in a normal adult for the contrast to reach iota after a peripheral vein injection. So we know exactly when it is going to reach the iota and therefore how it is going to reach the carotid arteries. Uh, in a patient who is old or having cardiac problem, then we have to adjust that timing. You want smart prep, uh, uh, automation systems which will automatically start the uh, start the scanning as soon as it reaches the artery. So fast helical CT is done at the time when the contrast is in the artery, it is the images. Uh, and another 10 second delay, if you wait, it will start seeing the veins of the brain and internal jugular vein. So the crucial timing is to sort of scan when the uh, when the when the uh, contrast is actually in the artery. That is the CT angiogram. This actual uh, helical data is modified in the workstation. It sort of automatically removes the bone overlap and gives the angiolic images. So it gives the so called CT angiogram. And the two things are there. One is we are rejecting contrast. The second thing is there is radiation involved in the CT angiogram. And what about MR angio? And so an example here in a patient who has got a supraorbital uh, gyrus uh, AV vascular malformation here on the left the frontal lobe. And we can see the CT shows done and followed by a CT angio image showing this cluster of vessels uh, on the left side and this corresponding distant plain MR film just to show you this flow void. Uh, so this is an example of a CT angio which was done. MR angiogram has got, MRA has got a unique quality of catching the flowing protons. So there are some sequences which will pick up only the flowing protons and therefore it is able to get some signal from the flowing blood and we can actually control the direction at which the flowing protons are actually gives a signal. So there is no need to inject any contrast. So you get, a, it's, it has got a slightly lower sensitivity and specificity compared to CT angiogram. However, it is a very great screening tool. It is usually combined with other orbital and MR brain sequences. So you get other additional information. Sometimes even a simple post-contrast images also gives additional information about the vascularity of lesion. But for to get these images, now you are seeing an axial view of the circle of the list. We can see all the branches, uh, all the major branches. And we can actually appreciate the internal carotid artery from the skull base and up to its uh, branching into ACA. We can actually, on a sagittal reconstruction, we can able to see the ophthalmic artery, posterior communicating artery, and all those branches can be appreciated without even injecting a single dose of contrast. And that's the uniqueness of MR, MRA. The DSA is done at cath lab and the catheter is inserted in the femoral artery, reaching the arch and guided into the common carotid artery and followed by contrast injection directly into the artery. The technology subtracts the initial pre-contrast image from the contrast image, thereby subtracting the bone and show only the vessels. And so you get the sort of name digital subtraction and geography. Um, it is regarded as gold standard for most of the vascular lesions in Mainly, example like an aneurysm. It is invasive, but it allows interventional treatments like coiling or occlusion of a parotid cavus fistula or whatever. Um, so this is a cath lab where you will be doing that particular procedure. So this is an example of a DSA where the contrast is injected into the left internal carotid artery. We can see the branches. We can see the ACA and MCA. We can see AP and oblique views. You know, after one sort of second, we will be able to see the various branches and the MCA, ACA branches, we will be able to appreciate small aneurysms much better in this way. But what are the pathologies we can pick it up? Carotid cavernous fistulas, ophthalmic vein or cavernous sinus thrombosis, vascular malformations like arterial venous, varics, venolymphatic malformations, capillary and cavernous hemangiomas, and other orbital masses where you need to know the vascularity. And these are the conditions where MRA, DSA, or a CT, uh, just to show you a couple of uh, signs 
to which I pattern when you pick up these ones are because of the ophthalmia, which is connected to the uh, cavernous sinus, and therefore the engorgement or even sometimes thrombosis is very useful. Cavernous sinus engorgement, asymmetry, clot formation, increased arterial supply, increased blood vessels, tortuosity of the vessels. Delayed filling, lesion enhancement, is it an intense or severe enhancement or moderate enhancement or variable enhancement? Now, these type of uh, uh, points actually helps us to classify some of the lesions, particularly when it's related to various vascular malformations. An example here is a carotid cavernous fistula. This is an MR angio where we're able to see the arterial flow within the cavernous carotid region surrounding it completely. So this is an arterialization of the flow within the cavernous sinus happens in a carotid cavernous fistula. On the left side, we can actually see the very clean margins of the left uh, uh, internal carotid artery in the cavernous segment. Sort of, uh, you can see the other branches as well. Um, another example here, patient has got a cavernous angioma on the T2 weighted MRI type and test. On the post contrast T1 fat set MRI, you can actually see there is a gradual filling of the contrast into this particular lesion. And, and, and see if you wait for about another five, 10 minutes, it will gradually fill up completely. And that's a typical appearance of a cavernous angioma in the retroorbital plane. Uh, another example of an ACA aneurysm, which is picked up on this MR. And, and just a graphic just to show you this aneurysm which is seen on the pre contrast. But on the MR angio, you can see the surrounding, surrounding thrombus and, and, uh, and at the central, uh, central aneurysm. Uh, another example here this is a patient who presented with the right third nerve palsy. You can actually see the slightly abducted eyeball here. And this is a pre contrast CT and the post contrast CT. You can actually show a blob of enhancement is seen. And this patient had a CT angiodon. We can actually see this is a classic posterior communicating artery aneurysm arising from it. And then patient one not went on to have coiling done. And, and again, a graphic appearance of a posterior communicating artery aneurysm uh, in this particular. So in summary, the MRA is a screening tool. There is no radiation involved and there is no need for any contrast injection. It is a non-invasive technique. Uh, it takes some time to complete it. CT angio is now very commonly used because it's a non-invasive assessment and planning the treatment for confirmation of a vascular lesion. If you have queries on MRA or doubt on MRA, then CTA clarifies it. High suspicion with the normal MRA, then you do a CTA. And of course, most intervention radiologists, before they do anything, uh, before putting the catheter into the, into the car for coiling or stenting or whatever, they will have a CT angio ready so that they can actually plan to the millimeter um, exactly what they need to do it. So that way CT angio is very useful. Only thing is there is radiation involved and, and, and the contrast is need to be injected. And obviously the benefits outweigh the risks, uh, we do the CTA. And DSA is usually nowadays then prior to endovascular treatment and solving sometimes queries on CTA. Sometimes a blip, blub or a blister-like aneurysms can easily be missed on MRA picked up on CTA, sometimes uh, very much picked up only on DSA. So this is sort of a practical plan for patients who has got a suspicious vascular relation in, related, in relation to orbits. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving us so much clarity, Dr. Uh, Murli, will you have a question for him? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Dr. Ambar, so I have a question that it is said in third nerve palsy, uh, yes. if you do pick up an aneurysm in digital subtraction angiography, that was... Sharing? Yeah. Sorry, uh, pl please repeat it. Yeah, uh, it said that in third nerve palsy, I recently heard it in one of the webinars, that in third nerve palsy, if you uh, do pick up a aneurysm on uh, uh, digital subtraction angiography that was missed on CT angiography, it is uh, rarely of any clinical significance. Uh, so is that correct for third nerve palsy that we can stop at... Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, in a, in a way, yes, because there is actually a variation, there is something called... A, infantibulum or funnel like a variation which can occur at the origin of the uh, posterior communicating artery which is sometimes um, you know not seen on C cta but often sort of picked up on the conventional angiogram and most of the time that normal variation can mimic like an aneurysm and that is one second and obviously a, a small aneurysms which are aneurysm like appearance which is not actually pressing on the third nerve uh, or maybe just an, a simple usually they are not uh, so much significance but but generally if there is an aneurysm in the pcom which has got associated with the painful third nerve palsy then most of the time i think they end up in having some sort of a treatment 
can thrombose aneurysms also be picked up on CT angiography because there will be no flow there? Thrombose if that, obviously, thrombose aneurysm, you can safely leave it. There is usually there is nothing to be done most of the time. Thank you very much. We shall now go on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Shikha Basi, so Deputy Director of Neuro-Ophthalmology at Shankar Netralia, Chennai, a dynamic presence in Indian ophthalmology, who is going to take us on to sinister signs on neuro-ophthalmology. Of course, the talk is going to be amazing, but we'll have to keep a watch on time. She's already warned us. <laughs> on to you, Dr. Shikha. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Team ARC, especially uh, Dr. Chitra, for giving me this opportunity. I'll be talking about sinister signs and neurophilmology. Sinister sign is a harbinger of blindness or of death. Hence, it should be dealt with urgency. Incompetent squint can become a sinister sign if it is sudden onset in an otherwise healthy adult, as was seen in this 34-year-old otherwise healthy female who came to us with sudden onset diplopia for three days with left uh, convergent squint. Extraocular motility evaluation showed abduction deficit on the left, uh, in the left eye, diagnosed to have left six nerve palsy. MRI with MRA brain and orbit re revealed a small aneurysm of the left intracranial uh, left ICA cavernous segment, and a similar lesion was seen on the right side as well. Patient was referred to an interventional radiologist for DSA and treatment with coiling. Incompetent squint in a healthy child of sudden onset should also be taken very seriously. This nine-year-old female came to us with sudden onset inward deviation of the left eye since 20 days, which was preceded by a headache. Her ophthalmic evaluation was normal other than the uh, left eye convergent squint, which again on motility, ocular motility evaluation revealed abduction deficit on the left side. And she was also diagnosed to have a left six nerve palsy. Neuroimaging revealed uh, almost an iso intense lesion in the left half of the pons. On T1, on T2, it was hyper intense lesion. MR spectroscopy revealed a golden peak and the child was harboring a pilocytic astrocytoma. Neoplasms form an important uh, cause of six nerve palsy in children, hence it should be taken seriously. Sudden onset incompetence squint in a diabetic is usually not a sinister sign unless associated with multiple cranial nerve palsy, swelling, redness, loss of sensation, conjunctival chemosis, as was seen in this middle-aged lady with uncontrolled diabetes. She presented to us with total ophthalmoplegia with redness swelling on the left side of the, not only the eye, but face as well. Contrast-enhanced MRI of the uh, brain in orbit revealed a soft tissue lesion in her left cavernous sinus and SOF region. She was having a fungal, suspected to have a fungal granuloma. The mucosal lesion from the left nasal cavity was biopsied, which showed plenty of fungal filaments, which confirmed the diagnosis of mucormycosis, potentially fatal condition, and it can lead to death within, within days. An isochoria with ptosis, uh, can be because of Porner syndrome, and which can be associated, if it has a um, history of pain as well, can be because of the dissection of carotid artery, as seen in this gentleman who came to us with ptosis, mild ptosis of the right eye, and isochoria with the right eye pupil, smaller than the left eye pupil, and an isochoria increasing in dim light. The sudden onset in complete painful Porner syndrome in this gentleman, uh, uh, led us to order MRI with MRA head, neck, upper chest. And M MRA neck showed focal dissection of the distal cervical internal carotid artery. Patient was referred to the interventional radiologist who started the patient on oral antiplatelet agents. Non-glocomatous optic atrophy, if associated with gradual vision loss, can be a sinister sign. This gentleman, elderly gentleman, came to us with 
a history of decreased vision in both the eyes since past eight months. He was on anti-glaucoma treatment for four months and his presentation visual acuity was counting fingers in the right eye and left eye, no perception of light with an intraocular pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury. The optic discs were like this. Our glaucoma department was not convinced about the diagnosis, referred the patient to us. Neuroimaging revealed a non-axial basifrontal, iso-intense lesion on T1 and T2, diagnosed to have olfactory groove meningioma. A hemianopic field defect, if it is gradual, unexplained, associated with gradual unexplained vision loss is again sinister, as seen in this gentleman who came to us with a history of uh, uh, with a history of gradual decrease in vision in the right eye, with visual acuity of six sixty in the right eye and left eye six nine, with essentially a normal. Uh, fundus, but the visual field showed a uh, temporal hemianopic defect in the right eye and almost a three quadrant defect in the left eye. He was harboring a pituitary, animal, which was causing compression of the intracranial optic nerve, pushing the chiasm up. Optic disc infiltration is really sinister. It is a sign of malignancy. These discs are characterized by nodular and irregular appearance with peripapillary hemorrhages. Uh, this gentleman, uh, elderly gentleman came to us with secondary central uh, retinal vein occlusion due to the optic nerve head edema, thickening and infiltration. MRI confirmed that he had a gastric carcinoma with liver metastasis. This is my last case. Traumatic optic neuropathy with epistaxis history, especially associated with skull-based fractures should be taken seriously as can be associated with traumatic pseudoaneurysm of internal carotid artery as seen in this gentleman. He had a history of road traffic accident eight months back and had a history of gradual progressive decrease in vision after the accident since past four months. And uh, he had optic atrophy in the left eye and extraocular motility evaluation revealed an elevation deficit in the left eye. And he also had an abduction deficit in the left eye. He also had this uh, cotton plug in the left nasal cavity because of the recent onset of epistaxis. We knew there was nil visual prognosis for the traumatic optic neuropathy in the left eye, but he had limitation of ocular movements and epistaxis. We ordered an MRI, which showed a mixed intensity signal irregular lesion in the posterior ethmoid and sphenoid area and originating from the cavernous internal carotid artery suspected a pseudoaneurysm, which was confirmed with MRA and uh, patient was referred to an interventional radiologist and they went a coil embolization of feeding artery and a catastrophe was averted. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shikha. That was wonderful and how you put together so many sinister signs. Something as basic as a, a confrontation method would also probably help you in some of very early diagnosis or some hint of a sinister issue, I'm sure. Definitely, so, definitely. I'm going to go on to the next speaker. I'm sure there could be wonderful questions, but we have to hear them all. Our next speaker is Dr. Hemalni Samant, who's going to talk on ischemic optic neuropathies, what management options we have, and how do we prevent the fellow eye damage. She is a senior consultant at Vision with Innovation Eye Hospital Laser Center, Mumbai, another highly capable ophthalmologist to reckon. On to you, Dr. Hemalini. You're muted, I think. You could unmute yourself. Okay. Am I audible now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, to introduce the topic, the bitter truth is that very little is known about the non-arthritic ischemic AION, its natural history and the pathogenesis. And unfortunately, there is no effective, consistent gold standard treatment. But the good news is that 40% of the patients experience spontaneous improvement in visual Accuracy, but alas, 15% have a risk of developing a similar event in the opposite eye over five years. So what management options do we have? The mainstay of management remains reduction of the risk factors. Some of the therapies that have been tried in the past are hyperbaric oxygen, erythropoietin, optic nerve sheath fenestration, but all of which have failed. 
the role of aspirin remains controversial. And when the anti-VEGFs were introduced, all of us got quite excited using them intravitreally till there were reports that the intravitreal injection itself gave rise to AION. The role of intravitreal injection of trimnosolone astronide is as controversial as is the role of steroids, oral steroids. So like I said, reduction of the risk factor remains the mainstay of the treatment. So what do you tell a patient who comes with NAAION? Stop smoking, control hypertension, avoid antihypertensives at night, regular exercise, lifestyle changes, healthy diet, avoid alcohol binges, discontinue use of any other antihypertensives like minoxidil or Viagra and sleep apnea, which is often underdiagnosed, should be thoroughly investigated. And if you do find sleep apnea, then treat it. Coming to oral corticosteroids. So the role of corticosteroids is popular, but yet controversial. Do they really help? So we all know that the rationale of using oral corticosteroids in this disease is to reduce the tight compartment syndrome and thereby improving the function of the surviving hypoxic axons. So we did a literature study and I came across Dr. Rohit Saxena's paper, Steroids versus No Steroids in um, Non-Arthritic AIONs, published in Ophthalmology 2018, where he conducted a small randomized control trial with 38 non-diabetic patients. And they found that steroids helped to expedite and enhance the structural and functional recovery in NAIONs, but their use did not result in a better final visual outcome. So if you actually review literature, you will uh, come across numerous papers, some proposing the use of steroids and some differing. Some experts have mixed opinions where they normally steer away their patients from the use of steroids, except in some severe cases of vision loss or one-eyed patients. But it's frustrating to tell a patient with NARN that nothing is possible. And the litmus test, in my opinion, is what would you do if it were your eye? So I did this little fun thing where I called some of my colleagues to know what their preferred practice pattern is. So Dr. Rohit Saxena reluctantly gives steroids in early presentation in non-diabetics with significant edema. Dr. Ambika chooses to avoid steroids in classic NAIONs and defer steroids in patients with poor controlled risk factors, even if the window period of presentation has been less than two weeks. Dr. Rashmin does give steroids if the patient has come early with severe vision loss in joint consultation with a good physician. And Dr. Satya likes to reserve the oral steroid option, one milligram per kg body weight for non-diabetics tapering over two to three weeks. In diabetics, he's reluctant to prescribe steroids and simply prescribes Neurobion. So my protocol based on the general consensus is I offer the steroids to one-eyed or monocular patients. And also to that one un uncommon patient who presents with simultaneous or sequential um, vision loss, but proven NEION, patients with progressive vision loss within two weeks of onset and who don't have steroid related side effects, I do offer them steroids in a tapering dose, of course, in a joint consultation with the physician. But the most important take home message is be cautious, be conservative for the use of steroids in diabetics, and in general, be conservative uh, in using the steroids in any patient with any ION. There is definitely no role of IV steroids. So how do we prevent damage to the other eye? There is no proven prophylactic to prevent the second eye involvement. Simply reduce the risk factors that you have identified and therefore a careful history taking is very important. Identify the disc at risk and discuss the risk factors, counsel them regarding if any. Role of aspirin, although controversial, I still do offer it to almost all my patients with NAION. Coming to arthritic AION, GCA is a great masquerader and early intervention is must. Most importantly, in any AION patient above the age of 55 years, do the ESR and CRP and rule out GCA because it's a true ophthalmic emergency leading to bilateral blindness. Coming to the management, the mainstay of treatment in GCA is high dose of oral steroid or IV steroids. I reserve the IV steroid option if there's complete loss of vision or if there's early sign of involvement of the other eye, such as an early disc edema or the patient complains of amaurosis fugax. The goal of the steroid uh, treatment is to preserve the vision, to prevent further vision loss, to prevent the fellow eye in involvement and to hope for visual recovery in the affected eye. Almost in all cases, temporal artery biopsy should be done, but one doesn't really need to wait um, you know, for the result in cases where the CRP and the ESR are high. 
So there is no controversy in uh, the treatment of GCA because the steroids are the mainstay. And the steroids are to be tapered based on weekly ESR and CRP values. Premature tapering can flare up the disease. There is no fixed formula for predicting what the maintenance dose is. But most important, watch out for the side effects of long-term steroid use. And a take-home message is that it's important to identify and treat patients up. early. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you short stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Um, uh, paucity of time, as I do want all of us to hear our other great speakers. We shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Ramesh Kekunia, who is a consultant and head of pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus and neuro ophthalmology at Ramanama Ch Children Eye Care Center at LVPA, Hyderabad. He would be dealing on hereditary optic neuropathies. When should I suspect? And what investigations should I order? On to you, Dr. Ramesh. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chitra and also ARC and AOS team for conducting this uh, excellent high quality education program over this uh, difficult pandemic uh, year, which is getting difficult day by day. I'll be talking about when and what in uh, what to investigate in cases of uh, hereditary optic neuropathy. Uh, in this six minutes, I will share probably six pearls which are in yellow font in my presentation. So it's, it's in different slides. That's what I would uh, tend to do. Uh, if you see the non-syndromic hereditary optic neuropathy, uh, they are mainly three mitochondrial limitations of labor's hereditary optic neuropathy, dominant optic uh, atrophy and recessive type. And there is also uh, X-linked. OPA1 to 7 genes, 6 and 7 are recessive, and the second one is X-linked. These are the non-syndromic. If you see the syndromic, this is also important. There is OPA1 plus syndrome. There is uh, MELAS, mitochondrial encephalopathy with lactic acidosis and stroke-like syndrome. There is LHON, dystonia, MELAS, and lay overlapping syndrome with the myoclonic epilepsy, because these are mainly uh, mitochondrial, and uh, many of us know Wolfram syndrome or Didmore syndrome with the uh, typical presentation. These are the things we have to look at when you are dealing with hereditary optic neuropathy. Uh, this is a beautiful slide by Virender Sachdeva I borrowed. When you see a asymmetrical temporal pallor, there is bitemporal hemanopia. Think about chiasmal. When there is a um, Diffuse pallor with the changes in the vessels. Think about something, vascular obstruction. When there is dispallor with the peripapillary changes like gliotic changes or sheathing, think about old papilledema or disc edema, specifically due to elevated intracranial pressure. And in children, always, always rule out subtle retinal changes, which can typically cause temporal pallor. And when the patient has typical temporal pallor with central or centrocecal scotoma, think about uh, nutritional, toxic, hereditary, and postneuritic. This is where our differential diagnosis comes. In addition, whenever you see this uh, uh, disc changes with large cup and with the quadrantinopia like that, think about hypoxic damage during childhood. This is these are the important things you need to. Look, we did a, a look up in this publication that we, we had 324 of childhood optic atrophy patient. If you can see the marked one, idiopathic, 30%. This could be hereditary. Many of these patients could be hereditary. We could not diagnose because we did not have a phenotype genotype correlation for this. So that is the magnitude. Probably, I assume, in India, what we have. Most of these are isolated optic neuropathy, happens in one in 10,000 patients. It usually affects engage. Why you have to diagnose? Because the lifelong, they will have this diagnosis. So you need to really prepare them for what to do. And there are other things, patients wants to know real diagnosis. And 90% of the patient, parents and sibling are a part of examination and testing. They have to be tested 
in this group. I will share uh, these cases, gradual painless drop in vision, right followed by left. This is very important. He is a mixed diet, no significant family history, poor vision in both eyes. This is, these are his uh, uh, optic discs and fundus pictures. There are no retinal changes. All of the optic atrophy patients, they go through this typical comprehensive optic neuropathy profile examination when they come to us. Either they are coming second time or third time or fourth time, or we ourselves will do go through this uh, thing. And we have ruled out optic neuritis in this patient. And obviously, pedigree chart and other things suggested that there is a point mutation in G11778 gene, which is a causative uh, mutation for LHON. Second case, associated with diminution of vision, there is IDDM, hearing difficulty, cochlear implants in elder brother. Again, the vision is very poor. You can see this typical comprehensive evaluation of imaging using fund of photography, looking at centrosecal sotoma, all that. Typically, as you rightly guessed, this patient has WFS1 gene mutation, which says about old Fram syndrome. The third case, painless progressive, early childhood, horizontal jerk in nystagmus, similar complaints in the brother. Again, comprehensive evaluation was done. Everything was negative when we did this genetic test, OPA1 gene defect. So when should I suspect? This is the most important part of this. Uh, whenever there is temporal pallor, nystagmus, strabismus, bilateral symmetrical or asymmetrical irreversible painless vision loss, family history, associated deafness, diabetes mellitus and ataxia, MRI, 99% of these patients will have an MRI and there are no other signs of uh, optic atrophy. And what do we do? Comprehensive, I will again say that unless you do a comprehensive evaluation, you cannot come to a diagnosis of hereditary optic neuropathy. Do a pedigree chart, examination of family members, associated disease. This is very important. Look at ocular and systemic association and then do a phenotype and genotype correlation. I would say I put it phenotype as a uh, bold letter that is more important than genotype. And obviously for the diagnosis, both are important. So always don't forget face, dysmorphism, examine family, rule out ocular and systemic association. I'm done, neuro and orbital imaging. This is some of the dysmorphism. You should never, you can say that this child has optic atrophy, but you forgot to look at the face. What is striking there is a craniosynostosis. This is a patient with optic atrophy. You can see calcification along the, the optic now. Typical neurofibromatosis with glioma. These are the things we should never forget. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity, Dr. Shita. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Ramesh. Uh, could, how soon does it become bilateral from unilateral? And does it uh, repeat unilateral alone too? In Libra. Yeah. Many patients with labors uh, can have unilateral to begin with, within three to six months. And sometimes we have after eight months also, the other eye could be involved. Initially, most of these patients get a diagnosis of optic neuritis if they are unilateral, most of the time. And subtle peri peripapillary telangiectasia, all these signs, if you can pick up, that can uh, expedite our diagnosis. In all of this hereditary optic neuropathy, I think we need to have a high index of suspicion. It's, it's a, in a lecture, it's very easy to give, but uh, these are all dynamic process what happens when the patient comes to you. Thank you very much. We shall now go on to our next speaker, who's none other than our ARC member, Dr. Rohit Saxena, who is going to deal on toxic optic neuropathies, what every ophthalmologist should know. On to you, Dr. Rohit. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chitra. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, I'll just do a full screen. Uh, so I'll be talking about toxic optic neuropathy and particularly about ethambutol toxicity, which is particularly an important consideration in India and again more so as we are evolving in the treatment. So, um, so toxic optic neuropathy 
Naturopathy is often kind of underdiagnosed or more uh, truly delayed diagnosed because uh, it mimics or it presents many other uh, causes that can present in the same way. It characterized by the papillomacular bundle involvement and will present with central or centrocecal scrotomas. These are a whole lot of uh, conditions, drugs that are responsible for uh, toxic optic neuropathy. In fact, the three of these are uh, very important ATT drugs anti-tubercular treatment and considering the high amount of ATT being given in our country, it really becomes the most important uh, toxic optic neuropathy. The other important one is of course alcohol induced, uh, which I'll just touch about, but mainly I'll be talking about tuberculosis related. Uh, more so, this has become important because we've recently had the revised national TB control program where we have where the guidelines have changed and it's now a daily, daily regimen Ethambutol is also a part of the continuation phase. There are fixed dose combinations as per the weight band. And although the weight band tend to decrease the risks, but still because they are in combination, the uh, stopping the treatment also or stopping ethambutol also becomes rather difficult at times. And it's important because almost 25 lakh people or 2.5 million people are on ethambutol at the moment, any given time, basically as per government uh, uh, available numbers, but they may be higher because many may not be notifying to the government, although it's a notifiable disease. Uh, always important to exclude other causes because LHON, as uh, Ramesh pointed out, can, can present in that gradual loss of vision, one eye followed by the other. So toxic can be asymmetrical. And of course, many other conditions like uh, uh, infiltrative or compressive lesions. Also to remember, tuberculosis-related vision loss is not always because of toxicity, and you can have direct involvement of the visual pathway or tubercular meningitis causing hydrocephalus with secondary optic atrophies and tuberculomas involving the visual pathway that can present with uh, visual loss. And actually in them, you need to, they are actually break through during ATT and therefore you have to up the treatment instead of stopping, although ethambutol is still contraindicated in any tuberculosis with visual function deficit. So we're talking about consensus. I'll just run you through some of the consensus that we had achieved in this excellent meeting of neuroendemologists from India, uh, which also included physicians and pediatricians. And we discussed about ethambutol optic neuropathy in light of the changing uh, treatment regimens and most of the people who are here were a part of uh, this uh, this program. Because of that meeting, we were able to generate an alert that was sent to the TB program and then disseminated to all uh, who are treating tubercular patients, including physicians and pediatricians. So what are our recommendations? Toxic optic neuropathy can occur anytime during a thambutol use, most commonly in the first three to five months. And although it's usually seen in higher doses, but no dose is absolutely safe. It presents with subacute bilateral visual loss, but it could be asymmetrical. Fundus may more often be really normal, but over time lead to disc pallor and increased latency in the VP is an early biomarker according to most studies. Uh, a very high index of suspicion because the patient often does not think that you need to know about his systemic problems or the treatment he, he is receiving. And of course, tuberculosis, almost everybody wants to hide. As an ophthalmologist, do opportunistic screening of every patient on ethambutol. There is no effective treatment and therefore early detection is very important. Also remember, visual function may continue to deteriorate for a few weeks even after stopping the drug. So it's not something to panic, but up to a month, you may see visual loss continuing. Among health workers, we talked about identifying high-risk individuals. That means patients receiving higher doses. They are low weight in the way band, receiving longer durations, drug-resistant TB, or those with extra pulmonary cox, patients with renal dysfunction, diabetes, tobacco, alcohol, combined therapy with linozolid, pre-existing visual function deficit, and young pre-verbal children. They are all high risk, need closer follow-up, and definite evaluation by an ophthalmologist. All should undergo baseline examination and a, at least a visual acuity every two months. And non-high risk patients should go a visual function examination at three and six month follow-up, preferably if possible at the physician level. For the physicians, avoid ethambutol and pre-existing optic neuropathy. Make the patient aware without raising an alarm. Follow up, ask for visual dysfunction, a very key thing because most physicians, 
even if told about visual dysfunction by the patient, think it's a progressive cataract or something and say that after the treatment is over, go visit an ophthalmologist. These examinations like color and visual acuity can be done by the physician and a high risk or a high uh, uh, sensitivity for physicians to pick up any visual dysfunction. If diagnosed, replace so the immediately. At the community level, create the awareness. For the patient, they must be educated, given Amsler grid or a pocket Snellens, use the Nixshare app, record any pre-existing visual impairment, and also record any adverse reaction to the drug. Management, we really, there is very little. Stop, replace ethambutol, multivit supplementation, including zinc, good nutrition, regular follow-up. The only other thing we often see is uh, methanol toxicity, which is sudden onset loss of vision. The only important thing is they get excavated discs over time and sometimes are misdiagnosed for glaucoma. And basic, again, overall toxic management, exclude Remove the toxin offending agent, vitamin supplementation, uh, hydroxycobalamin injections, maybe in methyl alcohol toxicity, treat the cause. And of course, many people have tried IV pulse steroids for toxic things, but really there is no role of IV methylprednisolone in any of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Roy. That was a great talk. You covered all the relevant questions which I thought I'd ask you. So we go on to the very important part of this uh, meeting and uh, all of us have to be keyed on. Uh, the keynote lecture of this uh, webinar is to be delivered by Dr. Gordon Plant, who is going to be talking on understanding and unlocking the potential of OCT in neuroophthalmology. So we all look forward to hearing some amazing inputs from you, doctor. On to you. Could you share your screen? Right. Can you? Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Screen. Yes. Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Next. Yes. Started. Okay. Well, I feel very privileged to have 15 minutes for my talk. You've all done remarkably well. It's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful session. And um, what I thought I'd do is I first came across um, uh, OCT 30 years ago, and there have been certain points at which I've seen where it really is the way forward. And I thought I would take you through those steps. So... I think OCT has been uh, as important to ophthalmology as the invention of the um, uh, ophthalmoscope um, nearly two centuries ago. And uh, uh, my hospital, the Neuro Neurology Hospital in Queen Square was opened in 1860. So the ophthalmoscope was new technology and the yellow arrows there point to two ophthalmologists. The one on the left is Marcus Gunn, who <coughs> you have all heard of. Uh, the other is Brunel Carter, who in fact was a pioneer of optic nerve sheath fenestration um, back there in the 1880s. Uh, the, the two red arrows, one is uh, Hewlings Jackson um, and the other uh, William Gowers. And they both worked at Moorfields and were experts with the ophthalmoscope, um, uh, in some ways more so than the ophthalmologists. Gowers wrote a, a famous uh, textbook of ophthalmosco medical ophthalmoscopy. Um, so there was fusion of neurology and ophthalmology, and here's what happens when it goes wrong. Um, here is uh, a, a whole mount of a, um, uh, of a primate retina with the uh, projection of the central retina uh, uh, stained with horse, horse radish peroxidase. And um, can you see my pointer? Yes, we yes. can see. Good. Yes. And you can see that uh, the disc, which has been called the papillomacular bundle, is not just uh, the projection of the fovea, but also of all the ganglion cells between the fovea and the optic disc. But it was so firmly held 
uh, that this was the this, this projection, the papillomacular bundle was the projection of the fovea, that uh, people actually invented uh, axons which went at right angles uh, to the other axons uh, and even invented a field defect uh, corresponding to their damage in glaucoma. Um, so it's very important that we keep neurology and ophthalmology together. So uh, what is the relevance of Mickelson? Well, it was Mickelson's interferometer uh, that set up, which he um, uh, developed to measure the speed of light, uh, which was uh, used in the first OCT machines. Um, his um, uh, equipment was 22 and a half miles long. So it doesn't immediately uh, sound very promising for ophthalmology, uh, but here we have uh, uh, James Fujimoto, and that first time I ever saw an OCT back in 1991, there it was, it didn't look very promising, did it? But here we are now um, uh, with, all, with all of these developments. So I, the, the, the three things that, have, uh, that I've been involved with are the residual deficit in optic neuritis, transynaptic degeneration, and interretinal changes in multiple sclerosis. So we've been hearing about optic neuritis and um, one of the debates uh, that I grew up with was whether uh, the primary deficit in MS is due to demyelination or due to axonal loss. Uh, here's uh, an, uh, an entire optic nerve from the back of the eye to the chiasm, uh, stained for myelin in a patient who died with multiple sclerosis and vision wasn't too bad in life. And you can see that extensive uh, demyelination. Uh, so Bill Hoyt was a pioneer in this respect. Um, people traveled to his lab, uh, to his clinic, to learn how to look at the nerve fiber layer using the direct ophthalmoscope. And back in 1974, he published this, uh, these images showing axonal loss in the retinal nerve fiber layer in multiple sclerosis. He could not get this published in neurology journals because they said, uh, oh, this is not relevant. Um, MS is a demyelinating disease. Exonal loss is not important. Um, well, we'd looked at remyelination uh, by following up VEPs in patients with optic neuritis uh, over some years. And although there was improvement in the VEP, VEP delays suggesting remyelination, this did not seem to relate to any improvement in vision. And we'd also shown uh, that in acute optic neuritis, neurofilaments appear in plasma, which are markers of axonal uh, damage. Um, so uh, the uh, OCT uh, by uh, this century ha had reached a point where we could start to use this to look at um, uh, axonal loss after optic neuritis. And uh, this actually is now my most cited paper and I think the reason uh, that it was successful was because I didn't look at a random selection or a, 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 an uncontrolled selection of patients with optic neuritis. Uh, I actually selected patients with a range of visual loss from uh, minimal to the most severe, which of course after MS, optic neuritis is relatively unusual. And by doing this, we were able to show that the visual deficit correlated very much with um, uh, with uh, axonal loss and not with uh, de the delayed VP, uh, which uh, is the only marker we have really for the extent of, uh, of demyelination, something we couldn't have done without OCT. Um, uh, the other thing that Bill Hoyt uh, uh, taught me when I was uh, in his clinic in, in 1991 was to look for <coughs> nerve fiber loss in the retina in patients with congenital uh, hemianopia. And he didn't believe uh, that you could see nerve fiber loss in, in patients with acquired hemianopia. Hey, could, could you mute, mute, please, if you're not speaking? Thank you. Um, and um, when I was a medical student, uh, I did some studies on uh, with Hisako Ikeda on kittens reared with convergent squint, actually a paralytic squint. Um, she used to remove the lateral rectus uh, muscle to produce this. And we showed that there were changes in the lateral geniculate nucleus. 
in in patients in in, in these kittens with uh, uh, with paralytic strabismus. Before then, it had only been shown due to occlusion. And so, um, I've always been very keen on the on on uh, taking advantage of the layout of the visual system with its single uh, synapse between retinal ganglion cell and uh, visual cortex. And uh, these uh, studies began to appear in glaucoma patients saying, oh, they've got brain disease. Uh, they've got atrophy in not just in the lateral geniculate, but also in the visual cortex. Um, and uh, this uh, le led me to wonder uh, whether these changes were secondary or, or primary. Uh, and also whether changes, other changes which were seen in the retina in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's uh, were secondary to the brain disease or uh, uh, due to primary involvement of the retina. And uh, you're all familiar with Wallerian degeneration. Here's Augustus uh, Waller, uh, who used this as a way of tracing uh, fiber pathways in the CNS. You cut an axon and you follow the degenerated um, uh, distal part of the axon. That's Wallerian degeneration. But we can see neuronal degeneration following damage to a neuron, not only Wallerian, which is anterograde, but also retrograde to the uh, uh, cell body, and also both retrograde and anterograde transsynaptic. Um, and uh, we've reviewed uh, the, the possibility that all of these changes, which are seen in the, in the central nervous system in, in glaucoma, can be explained uh, by damage at the level of the retinal ganglion cells. And, and uh, these are the various locations and how we can image uh, this type of damage, but it can all be ascribed to retinal ganglion cell uh, damage. And um, I was also aware of this interesting uh, study from the 60s by Van Buren, who had sectioned the chiasm uh, in uh, primates and looked at the retina 20 months later. And uh, as expected, this is retrograde degeneration. There were no retinal ganglion cells uh, on the nasal hemiretina, but also this cystic change in the inner nuclear layer. We'll come back to that later. Um, but he also uh, carried out occipital lobectomy and uh, looked at the retina at 48 months. And there are still surviving ganglion cells, but much uh, thinned. Uh, corresponding to the uh, hemi retina uh, involved with the with the um, uh, with the loss of vision. Uh, so this was against um, what uh, Bill Hoyt had taught me, and we also had a, a classic example of an N of one uh, study. Uh, Neil Miller and, and Steve Newman uh, they found the oldest person they could with the longest standing occipital stroke, and they couldn't see any changes in the retina using these techniques that Bill Hoyt had taught them uh, to look for nerve fiber loss. Um, so uh, we all know that uh, we saw an example of band atrophy earlier, and we all know that it's difficult to see. Um, it's difficult to persuade people that it's present in cases like this, this is as severe as it can get. This is a chiasmal uh, transection in a human. Um, and we also uh, know that we see it with tract lesions because this is again, direct retrograde degeneration. And Bill Hoyt produced this uh, lovely figure explaining the pattern of loss with a homeopathic loss in one eye and band atrophy in the other. And um, I find it easier to explain band atrophy to people in cases like this, uh, which is uh, so-called twin peaks papilledema, because here is the band atrophy. Uh, there are no nerve fibers here, so we can only get uh, papilledema at the upper and lower folds. Those of you who speak Spanish uh, will know that the twin peaks in San Francisco uh, were named by the Spanish after uh, certain features of female anatomy. And uh, we went on to show uh, triple peaks papilledema in this patient, but that's something that your ancient civilization uh, uh, came up with many years ago. So here's a retro chiasmal lesion. Can anyone see the band atrophy uh, in one eye and the mild subtle atrophy in the other eye? 
So um, initially we took uh, cases with very long standing lesions, possibly congenital, and, and showed that with OCT, very difficult uh, clinically, uh, but this uh, type of band atrophy that you see with chiasmal lesions, you can see in, uh, in the eye with the uh, temporal uh, hemianopia, uh, can detect this very easily on OCT. So there's a right hemianopia, here's a left hemianopia uh, with band um, atrophy. And um, uh, we then looked at a much uh, larger group and these um, are the eyes <coughs> with nasal hemianopia. And we had an acquired group, a congenital group and a control group. And uh, there was the greatest thinning in the congenital group uh, fitting with uh, the fact that it's visible uh, with ophthalmoscopy, uh, but there was also thinning in the acquired group. Uh, th this is how it looks in the eye uh, with the uh, crossing fiber defect. But you can see this much more clearly if uh, you uh, take the sectors, uh, here they are, in a, in, and look at them in a mirror symmetric fashion as ratios. So what you get now is for the controls, you get a ratio of one because there's no difference between the two eyes. And now you can see where we have greater loss of non-crossing fibers and greater loss of crossing fibers. So this is now uh, more detail in the familiar um, uh, band atrophy. You can see that the, uh, the it's really is the, um, uh, the nasal part of the disc that has the, 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 the greatest proportion of, um, uh, of crossing fibers. Now, of course, along has come, um, I mean, we had to jump through hoops to prove it, but now we can look at the ganglion cell layer and it's like looking at a visual field. There's a congenital uh, hemianopia. Uh, and here we have uh, hemianopic um, uh, sectors, partial quadrantic lesions. Uh, actually, we did publish a paper on homonymous quadrantinopia, uh, but it was very difficult to show uh, convincingly with the nerve fiber layer. We needed a lot of cases. Here you only, now you only need one. So, uh, and we were also able to show uh, by looking at um, uh, two groups this was a group of 38 patients with long-standing hemianopia, and we were able to show how the, uh, uh, the thinning occurred very, very slowly over a matter of years. Uh, here's the um, age of the patient, uh, the duration of the um, uh, occipital lesion in log years, and, and this is the, uh, uh, the relationship uh, uh, with this surface. So it, it's a slow loss that gets slower as time goes by. And then uh, here are a few cases we looked over some years following their stroke. And other than this patient who probably had, uh, who did have lateral geniculate nucleus involvement with the stroke, you can see this is a slow process uh, uh, carrying on uh, over a matter of years, but it really does occur. Uh, so it's, it's interesting to look again at the uh, congenital cases uh, to see what kind of residual vision they have compared to these acquired uh, strokes. And of course, uh, there are many attempts to at uh, neuroprotection, but that tends to be for the damaged axon. Uh, this is a much slower process and I think holds much more hope for uh, neuroprotection um, uh, because of that. So, uh, and very little know, is known about the, um, uh, what actually causes this. So um, this is the retina in MS, and uh, Ari Green uh, came up with this very interesting uh, paper uh, on uh, pathology of MS retina. Um, and here's the uh, normal retina with the inner nuclear layer here. And uh, you can see this cystic change in the inner nuclear layer of uh, the MS patients. And he went on to show uh, that this can be demonstrated on OCT, as you can see here, and then it relates to the severity of the disease. Uh, so this interested me again, uh, because uh, I had seen this. Um, if you cut the chiasm, Van Buren showed, you get this massive cystic change in the inner nuclear layer. And this has also been reported in human pathology. 
pathological studies of the eye in patients who in life had optic neuropathy. Um, so what we did was look at uh, these, uh, I've been studying this epidemic, now endemic optic neuropathy in Tanzania uh, for um, since the 90s. And um, uh, we managed to get an OCT machine out there. And they have this very characteristic loss of this centrosecal uh, projection that I was talking about uh, earlier. Um, and uh, we were able to show that they also get this cystic change. And here it shows very nicely on the infrared. And here is the cystic change here. And, and, and in fact, it relates entirely to the nerve fiber loss. So this is much more like uh, what Van Buren uh, was showing uh, on, on a lesser scale. And the more severe the uh, axonal loss in these patients, the more likely you are to see this uh, cystic change. So um, and it, it's had an unfortunate um, uh, episode in terms of nomenclature because there is already something called microcystic macular edema in the literature, um, but that's what they wanted to call it. But Abeg uh, did something different from us. He just looked at a whole range of optic neuropathies from any cause at all and found this change. Um, so he proposed that this is a retrograde maculopathy, which certainly is what we suspected in our cases, so a transsynaptic uh, retrograde maculopathy. But we know that inflammation does occur in the retina in, in MS. So it may be that there's two things going on here. There is inflammation in the retina uh, 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 causing this uh, edema, but there is also in a more permanent change due to axonal loss and retrograde degeneration. So <clears throat> this is when I was a registrar at Queen Square, um, uh, uh, Ian MacDonald um, uh, published this uh, review of um, uh, uh, fluorescent angiography and acute optic neuritis. And in fact, these changes are not related directly to the optic neuritis. It was just as likely to see them in, in the other eye. Uh, so what we're doing now is, is combining uh, OCT with neurophysiology and we have a, a paper in submission now, which shows that there is a relationship between the P50 amplitude of the pattern EMG, uh, which uh, is, uh, reflects um, uh, retinal uh, function, particularly bipolar uh, cell function, uh, as opposed to the N95, which is ganglion cell. And that relates very clearly to nerve fiber loss and ganglion cell loss. Uh, but we find there is a co correlation between the in a nuclear layer thickness and the P50 ampli amplitude. And uh, so what we now don't know is whether this is a transsynaptic uh, change uh, such as seen with any optic neuropathy or this, whether this represents specific inflammation in the, um, in the retina in, in multiple sclerosis. Uh, so, uh, so that's been my relationship with OCT over the last uh, 30 years since I first Saw, saw the first image, um, but um, uh, please take this as an indication that, that you, 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 your group here is absolutely fantastic. You're all well entrenched in both neurology and ophthalmology, and that's the way we need to be, but we need to educate our colleagues as well. Um, and uh, we also need to make sure we continue training neuro-ophthalmologists and uh, medical uh, ophthalmologists and thank you very much for asking me to speak and to attend this wonderful meeting. And uh, I, I, I thank you again. That's the end. Thank you very much. That was an amazing talk we all heard. Could you stop sharing your screen? There we go. Thank you. Murli, do you have anything to ask before I give my concluding remarks? Yes, uh, Dr. Gordon, uh, is there a difference in the pattern of nerve fiber loss uh, between neuromyelitis, NMOSD, uh, neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders and uh, uh, optic neuritis and MS when you study them on OCT? Did you find any difference? Much worse, much more severe. That's the main difference. Um, and of course, there is less evidence of demyelination with the NMO. There probably is some demyelination. Uh, but uh, NMO seems to be predominantly a glial cell uh, immune condition. 
um, and uh, is much more causes much more axonal loss. So that's the that's the main difference. Uh, you get um, the the microcystic change in the inner nuclear layer. You get that with all the different types of optic neuritis. So I think it's been a long day. So I should conclude a wonderful, wonderful webinar it's been. And I don't know about each of you. I really learned so much today. This could not have been possible at all with the ex without the expertise of this great uh, panel here. And of course, the very great talks and so crisp and uh, succinct talks of each and every one of you. My thanks are due to my co-moderator, Dr. Murli, who I'm sure all of you would have realized that he has just left no stones unturned to make it a truly remembered webinar. My thanks are always due to AOS admin, Mr. Kripal and his team, our very able Mr. Sunil, who has been the webinar admin and is always uh, very committed and sincere to ensure that the webinar goes off sequentially. My thanks to Sai and Manjula from Numerotech for their background support at all times. My most heartfelt thanks to Entol for helping me realize this dream to reach out to one and all of you in this audience because they have sponsored every event of ours. And finally, and most importantly, my thanks to our dear attendees for attending in full strength to make it such a great webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, one and all of you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.